sitting up there jacked with Pepsi. <laughs> I'm there for the pack out. You just got to pack me in. Committed to the bow early on. Like, I love getting close and putting up. You cover a range of stuff on here, too, right? Like, we call this the, uh, the THP World Headquarters. You know, my grandpa Roy Weatherby. I came into, like, that golden little pocket where there was, like, four or five different bowls. Just... You're Canadian? We're doing yeah, a I... Canadian podcast? My name's Douglas Stoke. I'm Robbie Denning. Roy Campbell. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so everyone made it. <clears throat> Stuckless, I'm glad you grew that fucking beard back because I wasn't going to let you on the show unless you did. Yeah, well, then, then I'd have my morning, so maybe I'll shave it off again so I don't have to get up for these. <laughs> you think we can get one of those little filters or something so we can draw a little, like we can change his. Change yeah, his maybe. Or something every time. <laughs> so it's different at, every time it comes on, it's a little yeah. different. Yeah. I was at the Canucks game uh, a while back and. The camera gets us pregame there. That's what they did. I, I had a beard, but then they enhanced it, turned it into this <laughs> giant orange beard down there. So, oh, really? It would be good for today, St. Patty's Day. It'd probably be suiting. So, awesome. I love it. What do you got hanging behind you there on the wall? Is that new or oh, is that always there? No, oh, that's always been there. It's just uh, maybe I got the angle. Uh, uh, a little different, but uh, yeah, that's just a little moose I got. There's a couple back there. No big deal. Pete, did no. you hang your, your moose from this year up on the wall? Yeah, it's fucking too big to come into the house, Kevin. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Get it in the door. Right, right. You had that LEH <laughs> and you blew it. I forgot. Sorry. Yeah, yeah there, there's that. <laughs> uh, I put my uh, bow back together. Did yeah. a bit of shooting yesterday. What do you mean? The secret with together? the eye. Well, I got new strings and put it on. And uh I had two bows that Athens sent me. I had set the elevate up and then I just set the axis up. So but I was telling Pete, so like I had that eye injury and then I had to get surgery and I couldn't shoot for about I don't know, four or five weeks. Mm-hmm. And then I got the clear from the doctor the other day to shoot, so I went outside and shot. And I guess I just overshot because the next one I was laying in bed, I was like, fuck my I was just throbbing, but he said, don't strain it too much. So I think I just overdid it, but I shot a few errors yesterday and it was fine. So maybe, maybe that's a key Pete is just take it slow. Yeah. Don't keep pushing all the time. <laughs> take a day off. Oh, that's, um, that's something to protect for sure. You don't want to screw around with your eyesight. Did you, Derek, did you get some strings made up? Oh, I haven't yet. I got a bunch of shit to deal with here. Just what, my... uh, <clears throat> sorry what type of material do you use for your string or do you know i can't remember what it is now i was going to use uh abb has a new material out it's just it was it's slightly changed from their platinum oh yeah it's had a high um durability yeah like different durability rating i'm not sure i'll have to look into that i truthfully i i shot and then uh i kind of think my because I just had the factory string on it, hey? Like, I was just mm-hmm. trying to ride that out as long as I could. I'm starting to see, I think, a little bit of variation in stretch. Yeah. Do you have a scale? Yeah, I lost a little bit of poundage. Not much, but um, it's like, I think I'm down like one or two pounds. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's just stretching over time, right? I, I wonder if that's similar to the BCY99. I like that a little better than the... 452x just because they can get more strands in there and it's yeah. tighter i find it's tighter because so. i have noticed that like the the platinums they shoot great but they do suffer from a little bit of durability like if you go on a couple like, like i really keep track of that on stocks because i did uh push the limits on an elk hunt where i it was just sopping wet and uh i did shoot an elk but uh yeah, it was like frayed when I brought it into my house and like put it on the heater. Holy, it was just like yeah. fuzz. And then the interior, I had a, a strand break just pushing through some buck brush, eh? trying to not get cliffed out. And it must have caught on my peep and, and tore one of the strands. But just definitely looking for that durability, especially with mule deer. Yeah, with the, four, with the 99 over the 452, I do find that 
you don't you like it's just the fray and stuff and the wear on your string is a lot better. You don't have to wax your string as much. Some yeah. guys swear by the 452, but Pete and I, we were talking about, do you use mixed colors in your string or do you use like a solid color? I'll usually use like a speckle or a mix. Yeah. Yeah. One thing to, to with mix is like when they, when they make those strings, the, the dye that they use, the ink that they use in those strings, it makes it a lot thicker. So you, yeah. so you, sometimes you do get uneven, um, like winding in your string mm -hmm. if you use colored. So like with the four, I got some four fifty two made for that elevate because I'm gonna just do a comparison of the two, the four fifty two and the ninety nine, and I got black and yellow, mm -hmm. like one solid black, one solid yellow. So I'm gonna be, I'm gonna shoot a thousand arrows and then switch them and shoot a thousand just to see what the difference is in like terms of peak twist like the poundage it, it keeps and then just the wear on the strings. So it'll be interesting to see, but I know like, so when they're using a thinner string, like the 99, you can get 28 strands in there where you're using, I think it was 21 strands on the 452. But if you use a color, you, you actually get even less strands than that. Now the problem with less strands is that obviously it's, you're going to get, it's not going to be as strong, right? It's not going to hold the cord as tight. Yeah. Yeah, and like I've been uh, sticking to natural colors again. Like for a while there, I was using like lime green and shit like oh, yeah. that. But now I'm sticking to like black, brown. Yeah, Pete and I were talking about he's going for function over over the Birdiness. look, which I think he should do the opposite. I mean, he should definitely go for the look. See, I think, edge can get. see I, I'm just gonna, we're going to put a disclaimer out here. I got two other witnesses right now. Anybody who's listening to this, I'm heading to Kelowna in a couple weeks to join Kevin with the BC Interior um, Sportsman. These other two, these other two guys are going to be there too. Awesome! I knew Ashley was going to be there. I wasn't sure on Derek yet, though. Yeah, awesome. he stuck list finally. Yeah, I mean, I invited him. All. I think he's going to come anyway. He'll probably just do like we he did on our whitetail hunt, just like call me Crash and say, "Oh, my truck." <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'm just, I'm wipe just... my truck out sorry i can't oh, make the show don't don't do that please no <laughs> anyway he doesn't want to be up there with get, me alone i gotta get this uh i gotta get this out because i gotta keep my eye on kevin we're gonna rebuild my bow here put on new strings cables take a look at everything karma's a bitch i'm boys. just saying karma's a bitch <laughs> he's just been accusing me of a lot of stuff <laughs> at the last couple of years at our 3d shoot that i've been messing with his bow and now i'm gonna let him tear mine apart so. uh Let's, uh, I just, I just want to have a disclaimer right now. If I start shooting four feet to the left or right, he's really fuckered with something. <laughs> no, I'm going to, I'm going to set it up. So it's going to be all gravy, but it's going to have a shelf life. So I'm going to time it. <laughs> Come the end of June, it'll just be like, what the fuck? No, I'm just kidding. Never Where is it. that? Are you guys doing that shoot again this year? Yeah. 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 It, July, um, 6th and 7th i believe is the saturday sunday it's the weekend what? after the long weekend of july where is that radium bc oh in radium beautiful yeah, yeah it's only like three hours from Corey or sir Derek. oh no it's so i that. i while well, we say that so okay i call everybody by their last name so like stuckless i call all the guys at work basso so like for the listeners of the show if you hear me call Derek Corey it's just because it's his last name I'm not don't think that there's another guy on the show or anything it's just I have a habit like even when we're at like when I'm hanging with my brothers I call my brothers like toy or toysy and it's funny they call me the same so like when we all get together it's like nobody knows who you're talking to so if the listeners if once in a while you hear me say Corey it's just because I have a like bad habit it's from hockey when i played hockey you call everybody by their last name and like i never very rarely do i ever say ashley i just say stuckless so just so you know disclaimer there on that one i'm just picturing you and your brothers toysy 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 to yeah go <laughs> or like well, you have to to I i'm like oh then you guys are like uh, you should the... see it it's quite comical but it's just i oh, and like Lord. all my buddies growing up like you know Cosminuk or Keysman or like I use their last name and like even the guys that work for me I only call them like I call them Basso or you know Bowman or I always call them by their last name so 
anybody yeah, that listen really. if you're wondering why once in a while i'll th- i'll call Derek Corey, it's because his last name is Corey, and i just i just have a habit of calling everyone by their last name Derek doesn't like it when i call him by his last name <laughs> i don't either <laughs> i don't give a shit i'm no, oh, I, fuck, I, dude I, your your last name's like a novel so it's I almost yeah like, most like, people <laughs> won't do it i get <laughs> yeah, yeah, i got yeah. nicknames coming that's out of the evening right. nobody ever that's calls it. You. yeah it just takes well it's funny too because <laughs> even like my wife i'll call her by her maiden name last name all the time and she fucking hates it so i could just keep doing it yeah <laughs> But anyway, I just wanted to throw there out because once in a while I'll call Derek Corey, but it's just like if his last name was different, it, you'd be more yeah, obvious. Yeah, makes sense. But anyway, I'm sure they figured it out after, you know. Oh, you know, yeah. I would hope so. Year. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, that string is uh, uh, 452XE. Oh, okay. Right on. Yeah. What what are you guys even talking about? What's for like? What's the number oh, represent? Oh, fuck's sake, Douglas. Well, sorry, yeah. guys. I'm not the. Bo- I'm... Did you not send are us you... a pamphlet? Okay. Uh, okay. Well, it's for another time. You probably have, you probably dove into this many times, so don't you don't do it on my accord. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Those are just that's just string. So once I get you into archery here, hopefully within the next, you know, soon sooner than later. Ten years. Whoa. Ten years? No, well, you have. No, to I won't. I won't be able to draw a bow in ten years, man. Well, I got some kids' bows we can start you out with. I got those. Hey, my sons have bows for sure. <laughs> so I got the kids' bows already. Yeah. Well, stuckless. We're gonna. I'm gonna get you hooked on this year maybe we'll do a whitetail hunt late season whitetail hunt this year and you'll have no chance. yeah i think we 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 owe it to ourselves to do that uh for sure well i mean yeah like i i no offense buddy but i just have like we got a we get all these hunts planned and i'm just like yeah yeah i'll just wait yeah i'm not <laughs> gonna mark i'm not gonna write it in permanent ink yet just pencil it, it. W- like is how many have I missed once or did we have we did have to hey, change man, I'm that gonna bear tell you, hunt. I'm gonna we just say one thing that bear you could build too. you could build a br- million bridges or you could suck one cock and you never notice <laughs> yeah, <a> yeah yeah <laughs> that's yeah yeah I'm not gonna be remembered as a bit a bridge builder no Any, I got I got it anyway so hey dude your office looks pretty looks pretty pimp in there you got it all set up now. You got your screens. So, like, what screen? Ashley was telling me about his setup he has there. Explain it. Like, he's got a fifty-two-inch computer screen or something like that. Crazy. Yeah, it's man. a fifty-inch. Yeah. Fifty-inch. Is that it's... what you're looking into? That's not what you're looking into now. No, this is my secondary monitor. And then I have my main screen that I'm looking into here, and then my editing screen is. You can't see it. It's right here. It's just sitting out on the far reaches of my desk there. And uh, that way I can have the whole timeline laid, like everything laid out on the one screen, except for a couple little ancillary screens that I use for editing. But uh, yeah, it makes it a lot easier. What's your chair like that you're sitting on? It must be pretty comfy. Because when, you know when every you... time I talk to you or call you or text you, you're fucking working. It doesn't matter what time of day it is. It could be 4 a.m. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? You you awake? Yeah, I, I'm working. I spent a lot of time in here, but that's a funny story. My son, who's, uh, you know, he's he likes uh, to spend a lot of time on his computer and that too. He just, like I had this $700, you know, office gaming chair, but it was a little more of an office chair, but it... Uh, He's seen that and he's hawked it. So now I'm back to, well, like a, f- a folding lawn chair or something. Yeah, no, no, but it's <laughs> it's a what would be a just a quality office chair, basically. I love how you go to buy like those chairs for your kids. They add the word gaming on it, and they add another three hundred dollars comes with the word gaming. Yeah, it's yeah, hilarious. for sure. Just because it's a different color, same chair. Yeah. Yeah, this anyway. one's just a black leather chair, but it's, uh, yeah, he liked it. Yeah, surprise, like, for the people that don't know you, you're actually one of the hardest fucking working guys I think I've ever met. Wow. Well, <laughs> I'm sure there's harder workers out there, but I I can grind. 
like, is there? Guys. And it's funny, like, guys are always like, like, a lot of people use the term, like, you're never going to outwork me. But that applies to a lot of the stuff. Like, you're always working. You're always working, like, you're always working at work. Like, you own your own business. And yeah. then, like, in between that, you have this other business you do, which is filming and editing for your TV show. And then you yeah. also have to, like, you still have to be a dad and a husband, which is, like, you know. I, I don't know how you do it. That's a lot. It's, like it's a uh, full-time job of doing being just a dad and a husband. Yeah, I just it's kind of got it down to a system, but sometimes it gets out of control. But I've got it down to a system. I mean, I take advantage of getting up early because you know the family operates on a regular family schedule. And if I get up, if I'm super busy, like you'll find me up by about four thirty, um, and then. You know, it's amazing what I've found, <clears throat> especially when I sort of, you know, I have my regular, you know, engineering job. That's, you know, I get two or three 40-hour weeks a year and the rest are 60-hour weeks. So it's pretty busy. Um, ma that's mainly just 60 hours a week. Yeah, but this is what I'm talking about. Like you manage a, you manage a lot and you do it very well. Yeah, and it's... It, Yeah, I use the use the video editing as sort of uh, as the putty in between. Like as soon as I don't have a meeting, as soon as I don't have you know a, a deliverable that I'm really crunching to get out, you know, there's an hour of time that I just put over to to you know the high BC side of things. But really, it's the key is that early morning, like in that first two or three hours of a day. I I probably um get ninety percent of the volume of the work that I'm going to get done outside of my regular job done at that that moment, and then only when I get into crunch line with deliverables and stuff do I start doing the okay the family's gone to bed let's go and crank out three hours till midnight then go you know and then go go monster mode but you know I and then what I find is. I'm I'm pretty diligent at putting tools down, um, you know, between five and six o'clock. Like I'm pretty dedicated to, you know, making sure that, you know, we're doing dinner together and we're doing the family time together, watching a movie together. We're going for soccer together, whatever. And then it's, uh, you know, it's if I'm behind, I'm always looking to get back to to catch up, basically. Yeah, that's the hardest part is trying to stay on top of it and not fall behind. And when you talk to most people like yourselves that are entrepreneurs and have a family and they also have this, you know, hobbies and like your hobby just happens to be almost like another business. I mean, you really have to utilize those early mornings. And it's funny, like you talk to like some people like the guys, I have guys that work for me and they're like, man, I could just I never seem to be able to get ahead. They're like, oh, I want to I want to get in better shape. My back sore, my knees hurt. I need to get. I need to start doing stuff, start moving. It's like, well, you know, why don't you? Well, I just don't have enough time because I go to work, start work at seven, work till three thirty, go home, and it's like obligations at home. Kids have extracurricular activities, and then it's like spending quality time with your kids, but they just don't understand the utilization of time, and that's one thing that. I think that all successful people, that's a trait all successful people have. And I, again, we talked about this when Greg was on, like success is all in the eye of the beholder. It's different for everybody, right? But um, you have to really make, you can't waste any time. That's the biggest thing. So if you got to use it in the morning, if you spend an hour or even half an hour, get up a little earlier, or do some push-ups, some sit-ups. I mean, amazing where time can go if you use it correctly. Do you yeah. Ashley, do you find when you're doing your editing and stuff, if you have to, I mean, with how busy you are, like you get, you know, kind of in that groove and you got things going the way you want. And then obviously your other obligations come up, whether it's work, family, and then you come back to it either, whether it's later that day or, you know, the next day or whatever, do you have a hard time getting back into that groove or do you have your mind pretty focused as to what you're looking for? Like when you're editing, you know what I mean? Like you've, you've obviously I, got I, some kind of mental picture of what you want 
but or does it kind of set you back having to take the breaks and then try to get back into that groove for speed for efficiency i guess yeah yeah for efficiency it used to set me back really really hard like it was hard to, because a and i still am there's so much you're learning you know that the learning takes time for sure and focus and concentration once you get the muscle memory down um a little more which i feel i'm in the middle of that is uh then i can't and because of the way my life and work blend is i became i've become more efficient at doing that i sort of make a mental step once i you know hit save and and shut premiere down and i know i'm not going to get back to it for six or seven hours i sort of it's that's where it's left off in my brain so when i reboot up i and you know the way the software sort of saves and and holds your last head position so it's not like you're going around searching where you were you get you get more used to being able to plug on and off i think overall i'd still be far more productive if that was my only job and i and i could sit there and grind it out but um but yeah, I've got it to a spot where it's not frustrating at this point. That's good. Huh. <laughs> so you guys want to talk long range stuff? That's why we got you on the show. I mean, to talk long range. You and Derek are like the long range guys. I wanted to hear you guys battle it out on long range battle? stock. Uh... Not, not battle it out, just talk about long range so derek is going to be doing when he's down here he's going to be doing this presentation at the where they're so the place that they hold the bc interior sportsman show and all the listeners i hope you guys can make it um it's a big it's a big facility it's got two rinks it's got a bar in there it's got a gym a bunch of um, other stuff uh, and it's got two soccer fields. And so basically they take the two soccer fields out and they host it in there. But off one of the rinks, there's this little, it's it's a fairly big, and they're going to do a big dinner. Like a, I think it's a beer and burger night um, from the, like just off location of the bar. And you got to buy tickets to it. And Derek is doing a big presentation on long range shooting. And I know we, when we were talking on the phone the other day, you got you got into long range shooting, and I'm like, dude, I have no fucking idea. It's kind of like when we were talking about strings. You're like, what the fuck are you guys talking about? And I have no idea. I was like, well, let's get you on the show again, and you and Derek can talk long range, and me and Pete can sit here and say, what the fuck are you guys talking about? <laughs> so you're shooting for fierce now. Is that like legit? That's your that's, go-to brand. That's legit. That's, Is that uh, custom? Are those custom rifles that they use? No, they're they're not custom guns. Uh, I mean, they do have some options, but I'm I'm using these are factory guns. They're just built to a, a higher tolerance than most factory guns that uh, that are on offer. So uh, I've had a lot of success with them for sure. So Derek, Derek, what was that gun? That you had on last time was that a custom gun or was that yeah that was a full custom so that one was a uh a maverick carbon uh tactical heavy so uh the carbon is because it has a carbon fiber barrel that one's a right hand bolt uh left hand feed all the way up to I think i think the bolt face can carry up to i think it is engineered up to 375 but now with pretty much we're limited to 338 with that new uh bill that came in for max energy um but uh yeah it's a heavy duty rifle that is for sure it comes in at around i think fully loaded 11 pounds the carbon uh barrel cut off a pound and then i have another one that's a lighter version of that uh so well i'll go back to the heavy the heavier one uh fully so it's a mcmillan kevlar and uh, carbon fiber stock, um, fully bedded, uh, Timney Elite trigger, uh, the Maverick Alberta Tactical Action. They're local guys. They've always supported, uh, you know, shoots and PRS and stuff. So I tried to tried one of one of their actions out. They're always pretty good for me. And then um, a proof research carbon fi fiber barrel, 
and then one of their uh, uh, three port brakes as well. It's a thermal Loctite one. So, uh, moving forward, I go to like a, a beveled self timer now. So like it, it has a beveled edge, so you can you can time it and screw it in. Then you just push it in, and then it retains that uh, top center point for your your center bore line. So you just push that in, and you can thread it in as much as you want. It's pretty pretty handy. That's because, slick. Yeah, that's yeah. slick. Because it's better than crush washers and, you know, just yeah. trying to work it out yourself or, yeah, because that's got to be set perfect. You can kind of tune with that then pretty good. Yeah, and there is that or there is one that I was looking at, which was there is the Hellfire um, as well. And Inside Arms, they have a really good one too. For for me, mostly what I found is because I don't really clean my rifles. I'll go like up to 200 rounds before I clean. That's just the working parameters. Um, that's one what, thing. Sorry, that, sorry, Derek. One sec. What should you be cleaning your rifle at? Like how many so, rounds? So, this is controversial again. <laughs> very but, controversial, but we're yeah. kind of on the same page. Yeah. So, um, and this goes for. So, like I've set actually I've set up quite a few fierce rifles. A uh, lot of so like fierce, um, Chris Arms. They're in that uh, semi custom. Uh, criteria so they they do have a lot of the features that you're looking for in a custom rifle um and then they also have some very nice as far as offerings for for barrel construction so you got your steel sporter barrels you have your carbon barrels you have a lot of stuff going on so um you know when you get into that um like fierce uh chris arms one one of my best one of my best uh barrels uh is on a chris arm uh Chris Arms blank on a uh, this would be like a semi custom. So the only thing that's not been changed is uh, the action. Everything else has been changed. The barrel that's the one that uh, is is probably my most successful rifle hunting. It's a uh, it's a tan rifle. It's got uh, a McMillan uh, Game Warden stock on it. It's a carbon fiber one. Uh, the action is a blueprinted Remington action. So basically when they say blueprinted, so essentially I send it off to a gunsmith. They uh, return the depth and uh, shape of the threads. So they'll what they'll do is they'll put in a lathe, they'll square it up on the lathe, and then they'll they'll essentially make sure it's all concentric and they'll square up their cutter. And they'll square off the dimensions of the bolt face interiorly. So then your bolt face is, is square and straight. And then they'll take your, your lugs, they'll square them up. And then the front of them, uh, front of the, the recoil lug, they'll have that squared. And then that well, is why all... is that? Why is that important? Well, it's like when I was talking about, um, you know, your shot to shot variations being pretty much reloading Well, you, you can't build anything square or concentric off of a non square action. Okay. So, but I get like, <clears throat> how much are we talking? Like by like, like within a thousands, it's, it's very, very tight. Yeah. Okay. So That's when you buy, rental. so the difference between, is that like the difference between like, you just go to the, Cabela's and buy a savage off the shelf. Yeah. So like a, a a better example that would be like the Remingtons, the old Remingtons. Remington's gone now, but Remington had a lot of issues, right? So when you take your take your gun to get rebarreled from a gunsmith, what they're gonna use is they're gonna use a new reaming reaming tool, it's basically a new cutter. And that cutter is a lot more sharp and less worn down. Because when you're on a factory floor, they have a tolerance they have to meet. So they know how many barrels they can cut in, how many chambers they can run before they switch out that cutter, right? So what's that going to do? Well, there's a tolerance. They're going to go, they're going to run it. The first few are going to be extremely accurate and depending, and then the back end is going to be extremely sloppy, right? Or very tight. It'll be some, some variation of that, right? So then what you end up getting is what's called machine lines inside the chamber. And that's just, you'll see like a little, it's almost like a burr. It's very faint, and what that'll do is sometimes that'll grab your cases. Like I had one gun, well, for a while there, it was like every factory Remington that was coming off the floor. Like if you're running high pressure loads, like at near near the max, 
when I go to extract, like it would, it would be bound up so hard. You could barely extract brass. So then I'd have to, on one of them, like I had to, I had to put a cleaning rod on the end and then smack it out with a mallet as I'm lifting the bolt. Like that's how tight. So there, there are issues with factory barrels. So, you know, I'm not saying that they're all junk. Some will be great. The Tikas are really good. The barrels are typically slow. Um, that's one, that's one criticism I have with that is slow. Just, yeah. They tend, they tend to, uh, they tend to shoot slow. They'll, they'll hit their pressure at a slower, uh, velocity for bullet projectile. So like, say if you were to verse that versus like a Furious, a Furious will typically be a couple feet faster. The, and Oh, I thought so. Like that, I thought it was all just had to do with like your bullet loading had to do with the speed of the bullet. Uh, to a degree, um, it has to do with what type of inner inner uh interface fit like in like how much the the bore interior oh, so that's gotcha. why I like button cut barrels and match barrels um so, so like if, if we're getting like, down the rabbit hole real quick yeah. <laughs> okay but like yeah. so i'm picturing it now from what you said like if you hold say you're holding like a firework in your hand and you don't quite close it all the way it's not going to have as much explosion as it would if you had like zero gaps and like completely confined space. Right. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Like, yeah. And, and two, it has to do with like your rifling. Um, so your, like more rifling depends on how many grooves depends. Like there's a lot of factors. Um, I, th- so typically, so where you see this is like, say if I did, Peter, like, you, Peter, you wake out. Okay. I just make sure Pete. <laughs> so if, say if I like <laughs> took a fierce rifle and I shot like a 300 win, um, 185 or like a 200, 208 or something like that. Okay. I just 208. What, what, what do you 208 project weight of projectile, 208 okay. grain projectile. If I were to take gotcha. that 208 and I shoot in the fierce and I shoot in the Tika, uh, the fierce will be going a little bit faster. That's just typical. That's just a tendency. It's pretty well known. Doesn't mean they don't shoot. The Tikas are great. They shoot great. So but, why why is that one shooting? It's just better quality. And uh, just well, there'll be and well, fierce will definitely have a higher quality. So depending on the barrels, like so, like Bart line barrels, they do a button cut, I believe, and. So they're able to control with the cutter instead of swaging. So there's two techniques. They know what works. Um, there's one that it like, as it's running through, it's swaging. So it's just kind of conforming the interior of the bowl, uh, the bore to then accommodate the rifling. And they just keep doing that. And they do pass after pass after pass. And that's what, uh, I believe that's what benchmark barrels they're doing. And then uh, Bartline is a button cut. So they actually take a cutter and they run up and down and they can control within four decimal places of the interior diameter. And they guarantee that. So, so then if you know what works and you're running a BART line, they can control that to the fourth decimal place interior. So you're, you pretty much know what you're getting. Right. And so, and that's, that's the difference between a factory rifle when we're talking barrel and concentricity so like a factory barrel it could have the end of an assembly line on the action but then the start on the assembly line of the barrel but then or it could be the end of the assembly line on for like their cutter for the action and then the end on the assembly line for the for the cutter and for the barrel chamber so what ends up happening is you'll have all these things compounding that's how you get the lemons right so those guys it's just it's and that mm-hmm. has to do with bullet and chamber alignment. So when you go to shoot um, a real tiny group, that's because it's repeatable, right? So if you're launching that projectile and it's hitting the lands at the exact same X, Y axis inside that bore, it's then going to pitch off and launch and shoot in the exact same position. And then it also too will straighten brass when you're shooting it and reloading it. So there's a lot of things going on. But then when we talk about barrel construction, so say like a fierce or like a full match uh, barrel, like some like full customs versus a factory, that's the main difference is you won't see as much of a point of impact change depending on temperature. So then it, because those match barrels, uh, they'll guarantee usually half MOA accuracy. 
Um, but that's because there is no stress in the barrels. So in factory barrels, they just, it's a, it's an assembly line. They cut them, they, they screw them on and they send them out the door. And when they do that, <laughs> when they do that, it is full of stress and the barrel. That's why some of those, like, especially like the Ruger Hawkeyes used to be no- notorious for that, like the seven MMs, like stuff with huge overbore, uh, those barrels will heat way up. And then you'll see an impact change because of that, because there's stress in the barrel. So as that temperature heats up, the grain of the of the steel in the barrel, it has that quote unquote memory of that that stress build up in that barrel. So then it'll start to kind of bend off and start releasing that bullet at a different point of point of the barrel whip. And so with match barrels, they heat them up to like 800 degrees. They they put plugs on both ends and they put them in an oven and that, that, that temperature change allows the brain structure to realign. And then there is no more, um, because of that, there's no, there's no more point of impact uh, stress. So there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, um, yeah. Okay. So back, so... back to what we were talking about for cleaning. Oh, is that how we got going down? Yeah. This? That's okay, how I... we got going on. This. Oh, okay. Um, for the get people are listening, uh, we keep giggling at Pete here because he's he does it looks like he's falling asleep, but he just went and grabbed a bottle of booze and um, I think it's like eight thirty where he is. So I didn't tell Pete what the conversation was going to be today because I knew he was going to say he had to go ice fishing or something. Yeah. Um. Okay. So temp. So the steel. We'll get back. Okay. Well, let's just give me a give me a rough number on average cleaning. So rounds. So going we'll back. back into- going back into like those barrel and the barrel construction, how they cut the barrel that is, and and two, how you break in your barrel. That's really going to determine your operating uh, range of rounds. So, so essentially when, whenever you have a new barrel or a new gun, always clean out your barrel right away. Like before you shoot it. Yeah. Always. Oh, always. I always just shot it all year. Didn't clean it and then shoot it every or clean it at the, beginning so this, this is like a brand new gun brand new gun you 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 went to the store you, you bought a new fierce rifle like what ashley's shooting um you always want to clean them and the reason is is because depending on if they screwed in that barrel right away most most factory uh builders are a little bit better now because they realize that um guys potentially if you forget you could cause some debris forget in your barrel them? Yeah, I would, I would clean out the inside of the bore, the chamber. Um, I would clean that out pretty thoroughly, pretty good. Biggest thing with clean, and that's just to make sure there's no debris, there's no chips, there's nothing in there that's going to cause. How would you tell if there there was? Like, I mean, I know it's, debris, but like chips it's, and shit. It's peace of mind. Like with like Remington and, and Savage, for sure. For sure. Like I'll see like shit from the factory that they didn't catch. I'll see... Uh, like some grease oil. Think about if you got oil in there. If it's in longer term storage, if there's oil in there, and a lot of them will do that to protect the barrel. If there's oil in there. Oil. You... I'm assuming oil is no good. No, because think about it. You're shooting a high pressure projectile at high speed through a bore with so oil. Clean... That's going to so hydraulically like... affect. That's going to hydraulically impact the inside of that oh so like rusting your old barrel off with like diesel fluid and like an Mm -hmm. sos pad is not recommended no (laughs) well and you know for some of those older guns there's there's different stuff you know what i'm talking about uh, in particular is mostly uh 416r type stainless steel that's that's pretty much the standard as far as barrel steel that they're using it's it's uh pretty resistant to rusting corrosion it's not impervious but it's pretty resistant and it does have a pretty good lifespan as far as round count, et cetera. But so when we're cleaning, you get a brand new gun, clean that out. Um, and then the next thing I would do is to like, depending on when, when you're, when you're doing your load workups, um, I would wait until some guns are really bad. But like so what's 200... load workup? Dude, so I'm like... a fucking dummy when it comes to rifle. You got to break this all down to me. So, okay. So, I'll backtrack and then I'll come back to that. <laughs> okay, but we're still we're still trying to get the past cleaning. <laughs> we're still past cleaning. So we're still init- trying. Yeah, yeah. Initially, so so initially, when you get your gun, you clean your bore out really well, 
and then and then you you start working up your uh your break in period. Some guys don't believe in break in. Um, I believe in break in, but only to, and this is again depending on what your objective is. I'm 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 trying to create an environment where when I'm breaking in, I have cleaned out any copper fouling on the lands in order to facilitate additional wear by the projectile to smooth out any inconsistencies of the bore at a slightly faster rate to get into my um, peak performance range of round count. So what that means is initially you have a lot of inconsistencies at the start of the barrel life. It, it tends to pick up a little bit of speed. Sometimes some of them wear down and there's a little bit less, but essentially what you're trying to do is just like wear down the inside of the wear down the inside of the barrel. Yeah. Yeah. So if you don't clean it, will it wear down the inside of your barrel more often? Yeah. Uh, no, it'll Can less. you over clean it less. Oh yeah. Yeah. Less. Yeah. It, Cause, cause right. Cause then you have copper fouling. So every time you're, and I don't get into projectiles with, with coatings, I, I, I what, don't what do you mean coatings. Like some guys will want to coat it with Molly. Some will want, uh, like, you know, the like coat, the whole casing, the bullet, the, bullet? the projectile that I, that is died off. And that's, I think probably a good thing because you get, um, some of these coatings are just, there aren't solvents for them. Um, typically you got to use like to clean braces. it after. Yeah. 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 So I don't like them. Um, what, I also, what's the, what's the ben- what was the theory and the benefit of having that on there? They thought it was consistency of like friction. Um, but I haven't, I haven't seen, I have personally, I haven't seen that. And two, it's what kind of makes you feel good, right? Like for what projectiles you use. But anyway, so once we're past the break in period, we're getting into our, our how many, our, okay. 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 <laughs> what is the break in period? It depends on the barrel. Oh. It really does. It depends on the barrel. Okay. Um, so like a really good barrel would have less break in time than a real shitty barrel or is it the opposite? Yep. yep. Yeah. So what about barrel, those car? What about those carbon barrels? Uh, I've so all my personal guns have carbons, all of them. So they're what? they're they're really, um, what the sorry, fuck yes. is a carbon barrel? First of all, so that- um, essentially a carbon barrel is it's a normal match barrel, <laughs> um, that they've put on a lathe and they've ran down the interior of the. So basically they'll leave, they'll leave the shank portion. So that's, that's a portion where they, they chamber the round, they push the reamer in, they chamber it. Cause we need that, um, that strength built up off the action, right. For, for that case to be suspended in there. So then we're not like, obviously for, for safety reasons, um, you know, whether it's 2.25 on off the end of the shank uh, and then it starts tapering and depending on if it's usually all the carbons are like Sendero type, uh, um, contour um so they're beefy looking barrels but so they put that blank on a lathe and then they they essentially cut it down the diameter in order to facilitate the reduction in weight and then they do so layers. like the out so like the outside diameter right yeah yeah so they'll like they'll have it where it's like full full length diameter of steel and then there's there's a sharp line and then they cut down so that the oh. barrel is thinner and then they extend it out and then that's the okay. end of your muzzle. And then they and, wrap carbon around. What's yeah. the point of the carbon? So the carbon is for lightweight and for rigidity. They tip their oh, for stiffness. I get yeah. it. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Stuckless, and, is that what you are your guns carbon barrels? Yeah, everything's gone carbon for me now. I mean, for the hunting application, you know, dropping that extra half to a full pound is is pretty essential. Uh, is that why they do is that the purpose of that is for that that's one of them and then because you get the larger diameter because in order to you know to, you can run a sendero uh contour uh at the weight of a you know a small sporter uh thin walled barrel you get the benefits of having a whip in your gun that's a lot more consistent you can group up the gun typically better Typically, that that extra rigidity of having, you know, a barrel that's about that big around, as opposed to, you know, that big around tapered out, it's uh, it makes a big difference. And uh, I've had good success uh, with both my fierce guns and uh, and with the Christian Arms. That was uh, um, 
uh, carbon fiber barrel. So when you say whip, is that what you were talking about last time, Corey? Is like the the yeah, consistency yeah, in that a, whip. So and it, we can even bring it back to what Corey was talking about about having you know everything squared up. So when that bullet, that projectile takes the jump, it's not touching the barrel. If it's not square, it has a rough jump. So when it goes into that barrel, it actually puts extra harmonics or whip. So this isn't a whip that you see with your naked eye, but imagine the violence of, of pushing something, you know, 3,000 feet per second in a matter of, of uh, you know, a couple milliseconds through a tube it, it's very violent and it creates a whip the the extra diameter in the the barrel actually helps smoothen that out where you can really fine-tune your load you're still going to have to reload you're still going to uh, you know to get the optimum performance out of it you know you're going to reload to find that right node where that vibration is very consistent and then then you're then you're dealing with something that can be very reliable and shoot, you know, better than half inch groups. So Derek, um, well, I, I, I was going to ask you a question. Though. I totally, I totally got sidetracked there on what we're, it was like, uh, um, you were talking about last time he was, he was talking about a wave or something. Yeah, it was actually before that, but that makes sense. So Derek, cause Derek before he was explaining like the whip, and then just the consistency of that when the barrel, like when the bullet leaves the barrel. Now, Derek yeah. does that. So, like, how do they, how can that be consistent every time? That doesn't like, so how much whip are we talking about in that? Quite a bit of whip, quite a bit of whip. So, so essentially, like you said, what Ashley's talking about, like with carbon barrels, you have that bonus rigidity. So it's, it's a handoff, right? You, you get a larger diameter barrel. For much less weight weight cost um so you know it still would be probably a little bit heavier than like a pencil barrel but it's not going to heat up as much it's going to be a hell of a lot more rigid rigid and it's going to be more consistent because of that typically what i've seen personally is um and this is lots of carbons lots of like big diameter target stuff uh lighter weight hunting rifles what i have seen is that the carbons tend to tune faster um their whip is like a very it's a pronounced whip and it's dampened almost i wouldn't say like instantaneously but it doesn't it doesn't tend to vibrate that much after that initial whip versus like a steel uh steel barrel will whip and then it has that harmonics that continues on so like with with steel barrels you could accidentally um, well, not accidentally, but essentially you could try and time your loads off of a node where it's not as consistent as maybe a different position of your your seating depth on your bullet. And then so there are more nodes within that um, time. And what Ashley's talking about when when we're doing reloading, and this is why some guys like to use tuners, they'll put weights on their barrel, they'll put those little donuts, they'll do all sorts of things in order to oh, either dampen. Out- yeah. Okay, on the outside of the barrel. Yep. Okay, yeah. Okay, now and- that... So, like, I remember old guns, like, they were going really, like, I have a 65300 Weatherby my dad gave me. It's got a really thin barrel. Yeah. Now, um, so like, so remember when we were out on that bear hunt, you're shooting across that, you're shooting across the canyon there, hitting that little t- white spot on that rock? What gun were you oh, using me. there? Yes, me? Yeah. Uh, that was uh, 300 PRC. Uh, that was the Christian Arms uh, Ridgeline Titanium. So it was real light package. Uh, but yeah, that, that gun could shoot. Yeah. So that's the same gun. That's the same make that you had the other day. Hey, Dirk. Uh, y- di- different, different make. Um, so like oh, that okay. one. I thought that was a Christian Arms too. Oh, uh, the, my other one is my, okay. so, so my, my tan rifle has a Christensen arms gunsmith barrel blank. Oh, so the barrel is a 27 inch, um, 30 cal barrel. Uh, it's an, it's a patterned carbon fiber. The proof research is a randomized carbon. Um, and that one, that's like my, my, like whoever has that gun, they're killing like that thing is so, a killer. 
so that six five three hundred I have, that barrel heats up all the time. Like you can only shoot a couple rounds through it, and then you got to wait half an hour for that barrel to cool down. It's crazy. Was yeah, ask, is that because yeah. that ha- does that? Sorry, Pete. No, no, I was going to ask, does that have to go back to how big the surface area is? Yeah, on, overboard. Because yeah. on, on that board? barrel on that gun is freaking super thin. Yeah, so that you you would have like... A, why a why the, why would they make it, like, why did Adam manufacture it? What's the point of having it thin? Light. It's just light. That's oh. why it'd be light, less but that material gun, cost. That gun must have a lot of whip in it because it's extremely long too. Yeah, potentially, right? Like, so say, like, if you had a, a real thick or structured, like, some of them are getting into structured car, like, structured barrels. They have, like, inlets oh. and lamination for added surface area rigidity and, and toning down vibration. That's in the real big bore stuff, like the. I'll King grab it mile. so the people, people uh, <clears throat> watching can won't see it. Another question for you. Um, I'm not sure if it's for cooling purposes or if it's just for weight. Uh, what's the purpose of fluting your barrel? Uh, it's a compromise. There, so there, it is. It is for cooling. Um, it doesn't make it more rigid. The physics don't. It doesn't line up with that. Um, no, it's different with structured structured bar, uh, barrels. Like where there's laminations, there's inlitting. That's cooling and more for for toning down vibration. But if we're just talking standard fluting, uh, that's that's just to decrease the weight overall and with a little bit of additional cooling because you have additional surface area, right? But yeah, it like doesn't this, make it more rigid. See this thing? It's tiny. Like see the size of the barrel? Yeah. Is that barrel fluted too? Just talking. Yeah, about it yeah. is. Yeah. <laughs> it has a little uh, suppressor or uh, muzzle, muzzle thing. Break. Like a, muzzle, muzzle break. Muzzle break. You screw on the end of that. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. So I never really, yeah. It, this thing is heavy as hell. Yeah. I always found heavier guns were easier to shoot. Hold it up. You know, obviously more weight to hold up, but it always felt like crosshairs would settle down and stay settled. Um, yeah. Whenever I shot them versus like those super light ones they have, like I'd be overcompensating all the time. You know, like oh, too high, too low. Yeah. If you're shooting, but anytime I picked up a heavier rifle. They just, I don't know. They just yeah. right in and my wow. dad, like the theory, my dad said, like my the old timer was well, not just him, but my uncles was like the heavier the gun, the less kick, and that was really the only purpose of the heavier gun. Well, it <laughs> it depends. I mean, like now we're getting really into it. We're getting into it. So there's two types of rifles. Okay, okay. Right? can we go back? Just like rewind. Yeah, let's let's, let's rewind. Here. Let's and go back to the cleaning, and then and then we'll get back right I'm into. I'm this still because... looking for a number for how so, often to clean a gun. The reason why we're going into this tangent is because this this part, the cleaning, it depends on the barrel. Carbons typically will. I have found that they will foul quicker, and they. But that's mostly having to do with guys are, are shooting them at too high of a rate. Like typically I would, I would limit at like when I'm going in the range and I'm shooting a carbon, I'm looking for just warm. I'm not frying that barrel because you'll, you'll have it insulated a little bit where you don't feel the full heat and you don't see as much of the heat waves coming off your gun too. You just got to take it easy. With what happens if you just keep shooting? You'll just, so what you'll end up having is you'll have a, a shit ton of car, uh, copper and carbon buildup, but mostly copper because you'll heat up that barrel to the point that you'll start ripping some of the jacket off. Like if you went real crazy with it. So essentially what I mean by taking it easy, I mean like we're shooting groups. We're just, we're taking our time. We're, we're not going boom, boom, boom. We're like, boom. That's shoot. the fun shit though. And I know, but it's, it's, it really is <laughs> what a thermally dumb. eroding your barrel at a significantly higher rate. If you take it easy, your barrels can last like 1500, 2000 rounds. Okay. If you, so like, with, okay. Granted with like a 300 win, if you okay. hammered on it, a thousand rounds, 1200, oh, you're, you're, you're done. You're done. What happens if I just had this gun and I shoot, like if you shoot three and it gets hot and you got to put it down, what happens if I just kept shooting it? What would happen to the barrel? Just get hotter and hotter and hotter. It the, wouldn't bend the, or like. No, it would probably it would probably bend, but it wouldn't like bend. Would it go like, back to that shape? Potentially it depends on how far you took it. If you took it till it's red hot, 
We just lost Ashley. Yeah, that's all right. He's probably who knows what he's doing. Um, anyway, essentially, so, what ends up happening is is like like I was talking about before. Factory barrels tend to have built up um, grain stress in the barrel, so then you'll initially you'll like shoot four or five, and then you'll see it start to point of impact shift from. So those will have like two zeros. You'd have your cold clean bore, your cold foul bore, and then your hot fouled and you're running in your hot range. So your hot, you might impact higher to the right or, or okay. left and right will, because you're will it wreck your stress. barrel? Will it that can. It can wreck yeah. your barrel. If it you it over... can if, if you went crazy. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Gotcha. But like, so I've shot a gun before where I was shooting and it got hot and I didn't really pay attention to it. And like my bullets started going all that's wonky. the stress that's the stress that's the stress of of the the grain structure like i was so, talking about changing so uh, now i'm a, so talking about that whip Derek. um is that whip now it's just doing every now because it, it's, it's hot just, it's, and it's, it's more it's, flaccid it's whipping everywhere it's just it'd be the difference of like it's perfectly straight from what your zero was and but now now it's got uh, a build build up of uh, stress on the grain of the of the steel on this side because of how they cut it and they didn't de-stress the barrel oh, so as it heats up that's going to change that bend oh. it's just going to slightly pitch you off of your axis of where you, you cold clean or cold foul board were so that's all something that you need to keep track of right so say if you're going to run a and that's what i'm saying like it de- the the clean rate of cleaning depends on what you're doing so you need to make sure can that you over clean you, yeah you can definitely over clean did i ask you that already yeah well no but you can over clean but <laughs> essentially the over cleaning is just you're you're increasing the likelihood of damaging the crown so that's okay. at the very end of the barrel every time you clean you have to be hyper aware of that crown that's a critical point of accuracy on that barrel and that's that's the last thing that touches the projectile as it's leaving the barrel. So if you damage that in any way, you hit that cr- uh, target crown. Exa- essentially, it's like the rifling comes up to that junction point at the end of the muzzle, and it hits a 45 that they cut in with their cutter. And if you damage that transition line in any way, either by running your rod like a madman or, or doing something really the, reckless. Where the barrel goes into the, what do the you call that break, part? Like at the end of the muzzle. Yeah, oh, that end. Yeah, that's a crown. Yeah, that's the business. End. What's so okay? So we got the barrel. Yep. What is this? So it screws the into action. So it screws in. You this got is your all action. The, this is all the action. Yep. Okay, so the action's not that like the action's where the bolt slides in and out. Yeah, and then you okay. Have your so now you're threading screws that's yeah, okay. anchored to the stock, and then and then that's what that that's essentially the the pivoting point, right? And then you have your barrel. So at the end of the barrel, like, or right at the end where it screws in, that's a shank. And then you get to the very tip of the barrel, that's your crown. And then your, your lance is inside the barrel where the, the case chambers in. And then the projectile hits the lance. That's the starting rifling point. That's where it hits the rifling and turns up the bullet. So, so like back, your accuracy could be a lot of like how well all these things are put together. Yep. So how's this gun? Is this like this is a Weatherby? What would you say like for out of scale of one to ten? How does Adam do putting his how are Weatherby guns? Weatherby guns are awesome. Oh. Yeah, they're awesome. Okay. It's just, I was hoping it's, you were gonna say they're shit, so it would explain my my shit. Well, no, it's, it's, you were it's, going. They're they're, <laughs> they're they're like like when we're talking about factory guns, you get what you pay for, right? Like they can only put so much technology, so much effort, so much tolerance and, and testing into their guns in order to pump them out at a price where, where the average guy is, is, is uh, going to buy them. But, you know, with the match guns, you're getting a more guaranteed process. Nothing's guaranteed. Like, they may have, like, a half MOA accuracy, but that, may, that doesn't mean a quarter inch. That means a half inch. So there is some combinations where you can game it, where you can reload into a node and, and get some real insane uh, performance. But, you know, with factory factory guns, and like we were talking about barrel construction, if you have a thinner barrel, you may need to clean more often because you're going to have more uh, more overheating, more deposits of copper. So what about bullets? 
Bullet, is that, man, does bullets, that, yeah, bullets are, bullets so are, does another, that, oh no, I know, but like, does, like, is there better quality bullets? Like, would that change yeah. the consistency of how often you're cleaning your gun? Uh, again, it depends on, this coding. is like the longest fucking, like, cleaning ever. Clean, like, yeah, all I want to know. Is- <laughs> yeah. So it's funny that he I'm asked that because again, typically I've noticed like monolithic core barrel, uh, bullets. Tend to foul barrels uh, quite a bit more, and that'd the crap be like leaving behind. I get it. Yeah, that'd be yeah. like barns. Well, it's not just the crap; it's because it internally stretches slightly. And then I've I've noticed that. Well, oh, the bullet stretches. Yeah, a okay. little bit. Whoa, yeah. hold on a second. A little here. bit. Okay, so let's <laughs> go back even a little bit further here. Did you say monolithic bullet? Yeah. The fuck is that? So that'd be like uh like a barns. Barnes bullet that's all yeah. one um metal um and if they're like depending on the metallurgy of the of the bullets i i like to stick to just copper <laughs> just give me something like a burger uh a hornady eld so, uh X. are you talking like with the little like nylon ant tips at the end is that no 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 so those are ballistic tips um that facilitates expansion as well as with the new hornady bullets that has some uh um uh meat plaid uh i think it's temperature temperature protection now from what the aim axes were so the aim axes they used to melt and then that would cause uh degradation of your uh bullet coefficient your your drag coefficient um so now they have that clear plastic red looking tip and it still it still facilitates proper expansion when hitting a target for terminal performance but it does significantly shield the bullet from degradation of your bc because it would it would you think about it you, you're going like you're going wickedly fast right so then you're melting that tip off and then that's where you'd see that inconsistency shot to shot and then the bc the drag coefficient would be affected by that but so like oh, that tip melts off yeah yeah on like on those flight? On, yeah yeah on the old bullets not the new ones the new oh. ones they fixed that problem they developed a uh, doppler radar in order to detect that and because of that they now know about that so i stick to straight copper bullets because i know the solvents can clean them that's why i do that i don't get to crazy coatings or anything like that pick a bullet that's copper i like that because now the solvents i can use i can use like a wipeout and again that's what we're talking about so I'm going to circle back so that we get this out there <laughs> and we can move on. But so depending on how you're shooting, if you take it easy with your gun, I notice that after I've properly uh, broken in my barrel and you listen to the barrel. So what that means is, is I'll shoot a group of like a dot, a dot, a dot, a dot, a dot when I go to the range. I'm always tracking my cold, clean bore shot. I'll always like put in the top left hand side. I'll shoot one. That's my cold, clean bore. And I'll I'll put that target on a piece of cardboard so I can take it off and I bring it to and from with me a couple of sessions to the range so that I'm tracking my point of impact. And then I'll I'll shoot and then I'll shoot a group like three. Now let okay, it cool so, down. Okay, so sorry, Derek. Um, <clears throat> when you. So your cold bore shot, you just shoot it once. Cold clean bore, I'll shoot it once because oh, okay. I want to track cold, clean, that. cold clean bore or cold yeah. bore. Cold clean bore, I always track that one. That's like after you cleaned your gun, you put it in your safe. It's just sitting in there because, and then you bring it out and you make a shot. I always want to know what that is because you know sometimes you're gonna have to track that. Some guns it's dramatic. Some guns it's like an inch and a half high. Does that have any, like, how you clean your gun if you're, because, like, obviously, if you've seen me, how I clean my guns, you're going to be like, what the fuck is wrong with you? What are you doing? Like, that just like. was out of there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, does that affect how you clean, like, how you clean if you're cleaning it, like, how you yeah. properly should, which I don't do? Is that going to affect that yeah. shot? And is it going to affect all your shots after that? Yeah, so it depends on if you're bringing it straight down to the to the bearing surface or if you're partially cleaning, right? And there's no way to really know unless you got a borescope in there, uh, which fortunately I do have a borescope. Um, I can check. Hey, what's that. a borescope? Just an endoscopic uh, 
basically articulated lens where you can go in there you can adjust the end but you can have Holy a 45 fuck, you just stick it down your bore and it must mostly for like the lands eh? or if you're seeing erosion you'll be able to spot that where to so say like oh my god we're getting into it again here this do thing. you do you do all this so like you you are you following what this guy's yeah. talking about completely 100 percent, 100 percent. yeah th this is the money this, this is good stuff see the difference is you've had five years or however long uh focus hunting's been on the air to nerd out on your bow and we're putting the rifle thing all in one episode so it's it's like a huge dump here uh well i there. feel so, like and it's you... and it's really good information i can tell you this right now there would be a lot of people uh, listening to this that if they are rifle shooters and if they are paying attention to precision shooting, um, they're they're going to be loving every word Derek's saying. Oh yeah, really I mean, Derek, for Derek's real. The man when it comes to this stuff. So yeah. that's one thing I'm interested. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, like the long range shooting is that's what fascinates me because it's a discipline. It's the same with like archery and everything else like there's an extreme discipline that goes into number one understanding how all this shit works because understanding your equipment and using it properly makes all the difference in the world like you could like yeah. i if you don't understand it's like shooting your bow if you don't understand how it goes together you're really not going to be as good as you could be you have to yeah, understand how it all goes to go together because there's like a lot of stuff like even like when you get into like bearings of axles and and cams and stuff like that you get into that that's going to affect your shot right and like if there's so many components to it but i mean i feel like there's a little bit more on well there is more on the rifle side because there's just a lot more moving parts it seems like than there is on a bow there's a lot of equipment requirements right there's certain standards that you have to adhere to just because there's we're dealing with machining, right? Um, yeah. Machining, projectile choices, power. Well, then you're dealing grasses. with like extreme speed. Yeah. And extreme heat. <clears throat> and yeah. those are two components that once you start adding one, it's going to like an uh, arrow is really, it's traveling relatively slow when you mm -hmm. think about it compared to like a bullet. Yeah. And so there's a lot that, that can happen to that bullet between, and it, we're talking like, a long way like that you guys are shooting a long way like when you were shooting across the canyon that was a long way i was like you're gonna hit that fucking thing over there like i couldn't even barely see it and you're like yeah i'm gonna hit it and you hit it and it's like it blew me away i was like fuck that's a long way and then derek was talking about shooting was 1700 meters or something like that yeah so like the farthest i've shot and that's just because of limitations is about 2000 and then 1700 uh 1750 with my 300 win yeah yeah that's a long fucking way man that's two kilometers yeah yeah i've uh i haven't quite stretched out that far i i think i've been uh working with uh murray at clark precision down here in the lower mainland and uh and we're going to start uh stretching out to those limits uh i've swapped over to uh zeiss scopes and uh i was coming off the swaro system and just the way their turret design is, it's it really it doesn't have the adjustability that's required. Yeah. Like I've shot everything from Night Force to what you know, the the top end vortex offerings for long range. And I I've always been a big MOA dial-up guy and uh and I just basically nosedived when I got into the swirl of glass perfect, you know. The mechanics of the scope yeah they, they they're reliable it tracks reliably but uh you know with the seven prc i could um the max range i could dial for was like 640. so i was i was pretty mm -hmm. pretty frustrated with that bottleneck not that i want to shoot animals at that distance but i like to train out to a thousand yards on steel so that if i do have to take you know quite often if we're above tree line that it's it's not uncommon to have to make a 400 yard poke and and i want that to feel you know you know like like it's it's an everyday occurrence um mm -hmm. i i'd like to get closer i have a couple drivers a you know ethically i want to be as close as possible when i'm hunting but uh, b i also want to capture the best film i can capture 
uh, which equals getting a little closer as well. But as far as training and knowing my gear, it's yeah, I like to stretch out. So I've shot out to 11, 1200 yards uh, successfully, including with that very same uh, Weatherby you were waving around there earlier. Uh, oh, I've shot the six the, five three hundred. Uh, well, mine was a three hundred Winchester Magnum, but it was okay. that sa- it was that same first light camel mm-hmm. job on that uh, on that Weatherby, and uh, I shot that gun out to nine hundred yards successfully after reloading in that. Uh, it is a pencil barrel and heated up and. And, you know, getting into sort of like the fluted barrels is kind of like the graduation of the industry uh, into carbon barrels because, you know, they took the fluting as far as they could take it, basically, uh, to get that same result, uh, shed some weight uh, and still have a, a bigger diameter barrel. And then that graduated into the carbon fiber, which is now, you know, it's really making a heavy footprint in the market. So I think when you're shooting out to those long distances, though, it's just practicing your craft and like wanting to know, push your limits of what you can do. It's the same for like when we shoot our bows, you know, 150, 200 yards. Exactly. It's just, you know, you just want to see what, how well you can do. It's not that you're ever to get actually going to shoot an animal at 150 yards with a bow. It's just knowing that like, it's just for, knowing that you could right and it's just like how 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 well have i honed my craft how well have i put all my practice to use like just you want to test your skills and like the only way you test it is just by pushing the envelope further and further and further right it's like with anything you always want to do a little bit more a little bit more i think it's important differentiator though to when we're talking about this into the in the hunting community to talk about the difference of what we do for practice and what we're actually going to do ethically for hunting. Because, you know, I I think even in my younger years when, you know, long range hunting sort of hit the scene, I was like, oh, great. You know, I'm going to go and get, um, you know, uh, an MOA rifle and I'm going to shoot elk at a thousand yards. Well, when you really get into it, that's that's just not a real good idea. It can be done, no question, but it you need absolutely perfect conditions. Like if, if elk you are do, tough too, man. Like fuck, that's that's a long way. So elk, uh, like the gun's definitely got the jam. It's got the foot pounds to do it. Like it, it's still delivering a, a healthy dose of power. <clears throat> the the issue becomes uh, once you've got everything else figured out, it really comes into you know, even at a five mile an hour cross breeze, how far that moves your point of impact and your ability to judge that over that distance is it's really difficult. Like, really well, yeah. Difficult. And when you're talking about taking a life, it's a lot different than shooting. Well, that's steel. what I mean. Shooting steals. That's fun. It's fun to miss yeah. and then learn what the dial is over. And oh, my goodness, I can't believe it. I thought it was only five mile an hour win here. Why am I still hitting, you know? Uh, five feet to the right of a mm-hmm. two foot by two foot steel plate. So you're you're shooting an elk in the hip. You know what I mean? Like that's that's just not that's a good funny. idea. But what's but the it's, furthest you've shot an animal? The furthest I've shot an animal is six hundred and six ten. It was a bear on Vancouver Island. Um, it was it was a good one shot clean kill. Um, but I, I really really think even that is um. You know, you got to train hard. You got to know your gear. Uh, you, you know, you you should have an understanding to Derek's level of long range shooting before you attempt even a six hundred yard shot. I don't on, a, yeah. on an animal. I don't like. I know you like. You guys both know a lot, but like to know as much as Derek does about long range shooting is like I don't know. You could do that for how long have you been playing around with this stuff, Derek? Uh, at this level, like getting really Pro- you're prob- into it. Yeah. Probably 11, 12 years. Oh, okay. Yeah, I thought you were going to... The thing about Derek is he's really, like, he's really... He's a super smart guy, so I thought he was going to say, like, one year, and he just no, already no. knows all this shit. No, no, no. Like, <laughs> lots, lots. Well, I of... just started messing around with it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, just picked um, it up. No, because there is, like, it can be extremely expensive. So there is, that like, oh, you can start yeah. out super simple, and 
and it takes some serious time, energy, um, dollars investing into reloading components and, and tools and equipment. Like I, um, like on my reloading bench here, I got like dial indicators and, and micrometers and stuff just for cases here and, and two scales. So, you know, the scales especially can take a, it can take quite a bit of time to, to build up some of your stuff and your knowledge base. But, um, you know, exactly what Ashley's talking about with, with, with distances. So like we just, we're almost at, we're over an hour now and we haven't even talked about how many rounds for cleaning. So like, it is very complicated that basically uh, though, yeah. like what we're talking about is we're trying to control either through our equipment choices, our case choices, our scope optics choices. We're just trying to control all the non-controllable things and then we control hyper control all the things we can control so once you have a rifle that's what the rifle is right like that's the the barrel is that concentric it's going to work that well that that's that is what it is once you've chambered you've done everything right so and then after that it it, it changes to our maintenance protocols how we treat our rifles how consistent we can be with that and then it goes into reloading but so back to the i'm just going to Throw us a number. Back to go back. Go back to number. <laughs> so you shoot your cold bore, you shoot three shot groups, you shoot those groups without overheating until you notice a significant reduction in accuracy. Uh, how do you know so, if you're overheating? You'll like just feel it. you'll feel it. It'll feel hot to the touch. Like, are we talking? Well, like some people's like if you have like hands like Pete that are just like really soft and like. Yeah, you know that's what could, these are here they could touch anything and they're like oh that's hot he's got no calluses hot, built hot up, to huh? the touch hot to the his, touch his his temperature is going to be a lot different than my hands which you know are man hands and they deal with brick and concrete and mortar all day the problem with so, yours is you wouldn't even get yours around the barrel they just you turn them max <laughs> out they just barely touch the top of it <laughs> oh shit <laughs> You'll see, so back to what I was saying <laughs> before we get into any more gouging. At the start of your barrel, there's that shank, right? So a lot of the heat is going to occur and, and accumulate there. Um, so the start the start down right by there. the action. Yeah, yeah, right okay. near there. You're going to see a lot of heat in there, so right? That's the start. So this is the start. So the start is where the threads are, where threads yeah, are. Right around. Yeah, so that, that's how the long shank. are those threads? Like how long? How easy is this to unthread from this gun? Uh, it wouldn't be. You'd need an action uh, vice. And that kind of depends on the brand, suit. too. Correct. Yeah, I think I've heard. Yeah, some, yeah. Like some barrels. Do those get, get torqued? Obviously, I yeah. imagine they. Get yeah, torqued. they'll get. Torqued. Are they like? Yep. With a torque wrench. Crazy. It okay. Depends anyway. on the specifications of like the the material too. So like, if it, uh, titanium would be different than steel, so you definitely want to check that with your manufacturer. I, I feel like for all this long range stuff. What we need to do is like get Derek to like come up with like a uh, a spreadsheet, and then like we'll have to like just work through all these things over like a certain amount of time. Because mm -hmm. like I feel like even for right now, I feel like I'm just asking you all these dummy questions, and we're getting pulled all over the map. Oh, uh, it's it all right. Feels like it's all right. I don't it's know if that feels like the. Feels once like you get into it like else. that it's that's that's how it is right you and then as soon as you unravel all these layers of complexity you start realizing oh really i'm not really controlling that many things that's the average guy usually is like oh yeah i guess i haven't really you you know standardized my cleaning procedure oh yeah i guess i'm taking my rifle out in a different state every time i go to the range yeah yeah well you then know, like hey, like this, what's happening the at the 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 higher end of the round count I think what right. I'd like to go over with you guys over time, like on personal calls with, with both of you, um, is more before I start working on the gun, because I'm I'm sorry, you could hand me one of your guns and I'm not going to be able to shoot it the same way that you shoot it. And I think I'd like to talk to you guys about what I can do breathing wise, like different techniques. You're just pulling the bigger like trigger, Pete. How hard is it? Oh, no. oh fuck. When you got guns this big, I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, it's, but the, you know what I mean? I, yeah, I would honestly, fundamentals like, marksmanship. Yep. And that's where I would personally like to start. I mean, I, I still try to go as much as I can with archery, um, where I am venturing into this year in September. If I can't pull it off in archery season, there are a lot of 
longer shots. There's a lot of slides and stuff like that. And I'm not talking a lot of obstructions. It's literally like I got to get from point A to point B. I can see you clear as day, but mm -hmm. there's a distance there. I still wouldn't be shooting. I still wouldn't want to shoot over 500 yards. And I'm talking with lots of practice and stuff. I would still dude, want dude what did you shoot that whitetail at? How much far was that? Which shot? <laughs> <laughs> he no, knew what dude. I was getting to, didn't he? Yeah. But I have shot in the past, like before I got heavy into the archery. Um, I got a buddy of mine who is, he's like you guys, like you start talking to him and it's, it's like speaking another language. And, you know, we did lots of practicing at four or 500 yards and the grouping was really well, but I've forgotten more than what he's taught me in that time period. Cause of just my focus. I've forgotten everything fun. Derek's already said. Well, oh my yeah. God. <laughs> but just knowing, Fuck. knowing the areas that we're going into, I mean, we got some massive cut blocks up in those areas. We've got, you know, slides that are across creeks and stuff like that. For you guys, you guys would be sitting there like, this is gravy. This is cake. Like that's an easy shot per se, if you can shoot those distances. So it's a matter of, you know, I'll cross the freaking creek if I have to, just to get that shot off. I'm not going to take a long shot. Just those, sh of those shots, Pete, are, they can be more tricky than you, you'd think. Like just like if you're shooting valley to valley, those shots, it's more about like um, practicing shooting position and then tracking that uh, positional shooting on paper. That's one thing that like, so like a loose tripod can make you kick to the left. Oh yeah. Or like, you know, depending on how you're going to, and that, that goes into a whole nother thing as far as like, you know, what bipods we're using. If you're using that bipod, I would definitely test out what you're using in the field to see if it has some sort of weird, I had a Chris, uh, Chris arms gun that, um, we were doing some reloads for, and they wanted to use this really long Harris bipod. And for whatever reason, it just was bottomed out and they didn't fully realize that there was a little bit of slop. And because of that, it was shooting five inch groups. Oh, wow. So, so does it like when you're shooting across. So Stuckless, remember you shot across that valley. Yeah. Is that have any different influence on that bullet than if you're shooting over land? Because now you're dealing with a lot of distance between where the bullet is flying and the bottom of the ground. Like, I'm yeah, just wondering, and, like, is that any, does that have so any? Very little, but in extreme long range uh, situations, if you've got thermals that are really heavily running, yeah, maybe a minor uh, difference for sure. I mean, wherever whatever direction the air is moving it is applying that force to your bullet okay. now but it what, doesn't what like, what makes that, a big it. difference in in that shot particularly that although it was across a valley it was still about a 15 degree down angle at that and we were sitting i forget what it was 650 yards whatever ended up being there um you know that angle mattered more than the valley, you know, not ha or having earth below you, having earth way below you wasn't really the factor. But uh, that even that 15 degree angle, once you like pretty much anything inside of 500 yards, you know, a lot of the conditions, unless they're really bad, super strong wind, sure, that's going to matter a lot. But you really, what you know, everything we talked about here today really starts to become doubly important you know from 500 to a thousand yards that's when yeah. you know all of these little nitpick details if they are not considered and managed yeah you, you're just not going to get to stretch out like that um and, and to pete's point even with the best equipment without training and practicing and putting like if if we're talking about re reliably shooting steel at a thousand yards, you you have to shoot a lot and you have to shoot at a on a regular schedule. I mean, it's similar to your bow. How quickly do you get out of practice? Uh, One day. Say, yeah, well, sure, you're you're tuned to where you're shooting every day. You can feel the difference. Well, it's the same once you're pushing the limits of anything. Uh, if you're not um doing it like controlling uh your personal mechanics your breathing uh your yeah. grip then 
you know, I, I went through quite a, I've had um, quite a bit of success this year in my training uh, with Murray. Uh, and I'm, and speaking about doing the actual training in the field, I'm going out for a field training test because, you know, shooting off a bench is one thing, but, you know, shooting off your backpack, uh, using your tripod as a rear rest, or like when you're going valley to valley, it's hard to get the shot angle. Uh, I think if you're shooting cross Canyon, you know, the slopes like this, you're looking for a rest where you can get behind and support your uh, the rear of your rifles. Almost, you know, it's it's in my well, mind more. I, important I remember than when you were shooting across, your feet were way higher than your than your head because I was making yeah. a comment. I was like, "You're gonna roll down that fucking hill. I'm not pulling you up out of there." Well, I, I purposely did that. Like I look for that body position, right? Like a lot of people when they would look at that, they'd say, "Oh." while the edge of the road or the edge of this old little landing area is is nice and flat i want to set up there no i purposely creeped out on there because like i said i was shooting downhill at 15 degrees i, I can't remember uh and, and then the range my range finder compensated for that angle and gave me a true dial up and moa but i purposely creep my body out on the same angle as my gun so i can get right behind it as opposed to leaving the gun up on that nice flat grassy landing mm -hmm. area and then having to jack the back of the gun up making okay, it less that. stable off there so i basically did that so i could keep the the gun profile so it was very easy to have a you, rear rest. you wanted the same and you wanted to be your body the same angle as the, yeah, the barrel of the plane. gun okay yeah. yeah so i had a question for you guys so um i was on a goat hunt i had a goat draw in the kootenays and it was a goat and i shot a goat it was 400 yards with this exact gun. Mm -hmm. This was a long time ago. And then we uh, we seen some elk, and I was shooting at an elk. And the first shot, I hit it. And I hit it um, really high, like spined it. And I went to do another couple shots, and I was, we were on quite the steep angle, like crazy steep. Mm -hmm. And the bullets were like literally shooting way over top of his. I couldn't get a fix on. I, I ended up having to go down down to where he was and shoot him again because i couldn't hit him again the second time i couldn't hit him again because my bullets kept going way over top of him yeah like and i was in... putting my crosshairs like the second time i shot i was like oh fuck i just pulled a peat i just missed and then the third time like i realized that it just kept they were just going way over top of him is that because of the angle yeah or, or toe support or or yeah or stock toe support You'll see that a lot with people where they don't they don't have consistent cheek pressure. And then what happens is, oh. especially with lighter guns, especially if you're in an awkward position, that gun will kick down hard and you'll hit, you'll see high impacts. It, oh, yeah. well, it was that's exaggerated, right? Yeah. I was definitely like in a weird position. Yeah. I don't remember. I never thought about that, but that would be considered like another anchor, right? If your anchor's off a little bit when you shoot your bow. Yeah. It yeah. It and make a huge difference down range. It depends again on, on too, like we were talking about cleaning the the state of your bore that that depends a lot so like say if you sight in and this is this is why i was saying like you shoot your cold bore you track that you shoot a group of three without overheat and you shoot another group of three without overheating you shoot all those groups three take that gun put it in the safe come out a second time and shoot a group of three group of three group of three like a range like shooting at 100 yards tracking it all with the same target on a piece of cardboard your cold bore shoot on the left then you got so then you have your cold clean bore in the top left corner then below it you have your your fouled cold bore shot you shoot your groups to three and you see what that round count is before accuracy drops off you track that the first time you go about all this you track that this is probably after your load testing etc so and once you've done that you will get a clear uh, optimal and operating round count range. Every barrel is different. Uh, my Chris arms is super accurate right out of the box. Like you'll shoot cold, clean bar. That, that barrel is just like bang on it's within the group. So it doesn't matter when I use that thing. It's going to, that first shot is a little bit faster though. It's about 10, 10 feet faster. So I've chronographed that too. So the chronograph of my shots, I know everything that's going on. I know though that, I'll go the so before I go out for a hunt, 
I know my operating range is three to 20 is the highest accuracy out of that barrel. If it's in, if it's in a hotter environment that that'll be at 20 on the dot. If I'm in a colder environment where it's like, it's cooler, it's, I'm not overheating the barrel. So like, say if you're shooting, if you're doing this test in 30, 32 degrees, you're going to have more fouling quicker because your barrel isn't going to cool down as fast. You're going to see that kind of accumulation of higher heat as you go to the end of your, your last shooting string. And if you track that, you really quickly are going to know, okay, I have an operating range of like three to 30 or three to 35 where I don't have to clean. But if I don't clean at that last point, it goes off the charts. My accuracy goes out of whack. It's 35 too dirty. rounds. Yeah, it could be 35 with my with that uh carbon that big the my uh, the dark gun it's like 200 i can do zero to 200 rounds before, before i have to it. clean that barrel that but again like what, what why do they say about? why do they say that like some people say you shouldn't clean 22s eventually you should clean them yeah I know like the guys that plinker and stuff they're like these guns some of the guns once you get them mucked up a little bit they start you get better some some well they're saying that too because like as you thermally and this is what we're talking about thermally erode your barrel so what this so what this is called in big bores it's a lot more pronounced than with with like 22s and stuff right oh, so is, this essentially what you're controlling is called your copper fouling equilibrium so basically that is you have those first couple shots this huge increase in copper on the bo uh, bearing surface of the of the rifling like the the grooves and 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 all your rifling uh you know it, it, that bearing surface is getting a little coat of copper essentially at the start it's this huge increase and then it's really stable and it mm -hmm. kind of and it, it's gradually it's increasing but because you're firing around down after it it's just smaller because that bullet contains a lot of the pressure in the room inside that bore so then it kind of wipes it off at the same time but eventually you'll have it kind of accumulating up some barrels are worse than others and you'll have it slowly come up and then it'll, you'll see this big spike of of pressure because now there's so much copper in there it's actually kind of inhibiting accuracy and consistency because it's starting to cause like an inconsistent bearing surface inside the bore and so that but that's depending on a lot of things it's depending on uh, what point is the lifespan of the rifle some are like the big 338 uh like tactical stuff that i've shot like some are in like 3000 round range three four thousand rounds and like you have to shoot them fouled you have thermally eroded that first part of the rifling so badly you need that smoothed out to the point that like you need a lot of copper build up in there in order to build up that bore so that it's it's a tighter and that's that's when i talk about like barrel burnout you know that means a lot for different people like if you have a quarter minute gun and then now it's a half minute well it's, it's probably still good but it's just whether or not the pressure and the feet per second is still consistent enough to track. So that's like, so when we're, when we're cleaning, we're going through our cleaning procedures. We're just keeping track of data. We know what's going on. That's, that's essentially with some of these sporter barrels, it could be 10 rounds. It could be 15 rounds. And then it goes to accuracy goes to shit with one of my cousin's guns is uh, he had a, um, a Mesa, Chris arms, Mesa five shots. And it was like big, big group. And then five shots and it's accurate out to 30 rounds. And then he's, then his accuracy opens up again. And then he's, cause it's too foul to be consistent. And then say like, you know, my dad's got a, a Winchester model 70. That gun is super accurate up until 15 to 20 rounds. And then it has this insane recoil impulse where it becomes very hard recoiling. So obviously there's some friction dynamic changing inside the bore because again the barrel construction oh. isn't 416r barrel steel it's grabbing that and two it's it's more susceptible to overheating as well and carbon buildup 15 In, rounds that's yeah kind of annoying so like how many rounds so basically every time you take it to the range you got to 
clean it up. To, to a degree, but that means so like say if I'm in a hunting environment, and then we're talking real, real big accuracy, right? Like we're we're like really good groups. Like that that Winchester, like I got that thing shooting for my dad at 300 yards, just shooting under an inch. So like that, like we're talking serious accuracy that's trackable. And you know, so so definitely like Pete's talking about your fundamentals of marksmanship definitely, definitely have to be uh, you know, they have to be solid. You can't be having any weird consistencies. So that's why we shoot the the three packs, because if you start getting to fives, that's that's more of a judgment and 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 uh determining of like your your accuracy, your your fundamentals of marksmanship. Three shots, you if you have like good predictable three shot three shot three shot and then you throw one okay well right three shot three shot it's good it's good if you do five that's a lot that has a lot to do with the the shooter right mm -hmm. so that's why i say doing packs of threes because then you're not gonna for me it's it's also having to do with i'm shooting primarily carbon barrels so i don't want to be pushing the temperatures right so but what you'll see is as long as you don't push the temperatures you'll have a good operating range and like i was saying before that means that when I go out hunting, I know that, okay, I go to the range, I clean my bore, I clean my barrel real good. Okay, I clean my chamber. Chamber really matters too, making sure there isn't a bunch of slop and shit in there because that'll reduce the amount of space for your cartridge and that'll cause weird friction points. If you have cleaner in there, not good, not good. So, and then I shoot, okay, I know that I take take my gun to the range. I put three shots down range. My gun is now good to go. I tape off the barrel with electrical tape. I'm good to go. That not now I know. Okay, this the bore is completely into its accuracy um, section. It's workable, usable operating range of I got 20 rounds where I can hunt with. And as long as you don't push the gun into extreme um, high humidity or high moisture, you're good. To just leave it as is. What do you mean I'll, push the gun into high? So humidity, like say if I'm sure. if I'm like if I'm in a real like humid climate, like on a coastal and it's very like corrosive environment, you're probably gonna wanna clean every time because so you'll, like where Ashley is, he lives on the coast with all the salt water, you must have to clean your gun quite a bit. Just more. <laughs> just, just more if I'm but like I live here, but I actually uh you know, do most of my hunting in the interior. You know what I mean? And up north, but just but for six, shooting though. Well, but, what, what's, does that affect storage as well? Well, yeah, sure. If you're in a humid environment, for sure. I mean, I have a, a humidity controller in my safe there behind me and what have you. But still, it's a. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, what is that? Say, what is a humidity controller like? A little? It's just a little electric unit there that, uh, Shit, that eh? keep burns mm -hmm. the moisture out of the air, um, but. No wonder I couldn't hit fucking anything with a rifle. But definitely, you know, oh, humidity. Nice. If you're if you're doing a lot of uh, hunting in the rain and stuff, for sure. Like I'm, I'm, well, clean and baby my rifle a little more than that. I'm not much of a of a of a bore cleaning guy. Like I, and I think what it's come down to in this whole conversation is just like everything if you want to do it well there's not a passive way to do it there's not a recipe book okay clean your gun every 30 rounds whatever gun you have on the planet that's what i was hoping no, for but there's apparently no, not. not no nothing's passive like that it's just like you're you guys are just gonna the whole reason i wanted to talk about it was i was just, you guys are just gonna tell me how to shoot better not that I, I even shoot a rifle anymore but never know with my eye that's one thing like i was kind of scared about when i was talking to Peter. i was like because I had my eye, my eye wasn't getting any better. Pete's like every couple of days, like, your eye get any better? I'm like, no. <laughs> like, and I was like, no. And it went for the longest time where it was like, I was looking underwater for like three weeks. And I was like, fuck, man, maybe, what if I can't mm -hmm. shoot a bow anymore? Or do that or go to left hand? But I feel like that would be almost impossible now to switch mm -hmm. to shooting a bow no, left hand. My brother had to do it because he lost his, he lost part of his, he lost a finger. But that was only he sh sh shot a gun, and he switched this way. Mm -hmm. But man, there's it's like yeah, that's why I said I think. Okay, yeah, go you, yeah, you go. I just I just want to finish this so that the listeners get it. Um, <laughs> there also is so like if you're running your gun steady, like a comp gun or something like that, that's different too, right? So like 
if you're running your gun steady, you're on a routine, a training routine, that's different than long-term. Long-term storage, if you run your count, your round count out to 200 rounds and then you put your gun in the safe, what I have found in my climate, and this is why I say there's differences between moisture, like if I'm hunting in the snow and I know that there's a high likelihood I got quite a bit of snow or anything in that bore, I'm going to clean it. What about dust? Sorry, I said I was going to shut up, but I lied. Um, what about like does really dusty areas? Does not that, as much. Like- not as much, but yeah, it definitely would affect things. Yeah, you'd want to control the amount of dust going into that board. But like all the dust, yeah, would that, like getting all like a bunch of dust in there and consistently shooting, would that wear your barrel down a lot more? Probably, like, yeah. No. Not as much. It's not going to be something you'd like notice, but I, I feel like anything that is not supposed to be in there is probably going to have some negative effect. Yeah. Yeah. But, okay. but so we're take, talking like so fine, like everything, the detail and margin for error is so fine when you're doing these, this at this yeah. range that any, you know, any little thing might, might affect it. As long as it's not super coarse, I don't think you're going to notice it because too, you do have a lot of air in front of the bullet. And that's that's a different topic. That's muzzle uh, muzzle break pull off territory. That's where you have such powerful ra- uh, rounds and a huge diameter. So like your fifty cal stuff that I've shot in the past, like that that is the bore. There's so much air in front of the projectile, it actually will pull your barrel off because it's actually like mitigating recoil in front of the bullet. So that that's a different territory, but you got to remember too, like there's a lot of things pushing air out in front of the the projectile as it's going down the board. So it's going to clear out a lot of that shit, but right. um, you know, just like for my, my type of climate, it's very dry here. So because if, you know, if I, I, this is something I've noticed and I'm going to ask you the same thing to you, Ashley, if you've noticed this too, is if I'm putting a lot of rounds down range, so like 200 plus, if I put my gun into longer term storage, like even for a few months, I got to be really conscious of that carbon because in my climate, that carbon will start to like harden to the point that it's like initially, if I just cleaned it off or chipped it off, it's fine. Like it'll come off. But if I leave it in, in, in it's so dry and I put in my safe and it's in a dry environment, it'll actually like harden to the point where it's like concrete and it is super difficult to get off, especially on the muzzle brake. Do you find the same thing, Ashley? Yeah, I've uh, I've definitely had an issue uh, with the my Christensen gun in the past with that with the buildup, and I wasn't cleaning and right, right, and, and because it was a three hundred PRC, it's got that steep shoulder in that. It was driving the carbon, and it was do- making a buildup right at that interface point to on where the, the yeah on the yeah. crown and yeah. And I was like, wow, this is, uh, so yes, I I have experienced that. Um, and yeah, uh, it's, it's, it was a bit of an eye opener on, on that rifle. So we'll see how I do with the fierce rifles here and, and managing that. I think that has to do with a lot with how they time the, the muzzle brakes too. So if they time it, um, at a certain point in the, the gill breaks, it'll start to create a turbulent flow in there. And she'll see more, some, some rifle manufacturers are better and gunsmiths are better at it than others for the, the depth, how deep they put that first, uh, crown point onto the gills, depending on the gill efficiency, you'll see where it pushes, it drives carbon into that front face and it starts to really accumulate in the corner. And that like, so say if they didn't have the depth correct, they didn't go deep enough, like put the, the muzzle brake deep enough on the, on the actual barrel itself, that first explosion of gas coming out the side will hit a corner on the gill brake and it'll cause a turbulent flow. And then it just drives deposition of the copper into, or the, the carbon into there. Um, yeah, it was slightly, uh, I, I did experience that too, but the specifically, um, and I had never experienced this before, uh, it was, because of the steep angle of the shoulder on the PRCs and at, right at the interface, right down towards the lands, like right at the jump point. Oh, yeah. There, okay. there was so actually talking, a carbon buildup there. You're, you're, uh, so you're talking in the actual chamber itself. Yeah, in the chamber. Oh, in the sure. chamber. Yeah. J- just for, and I hadn't experienced that before. And it sort of, it was the first time I sort of had, uh, you know, 
an aha moment of of whether I should be a little more diligent on the cleaning front because I hadn't been and that was the first time where I felt like it sort of bit me like I to the point where you know I had a case come apart and I I'm not it had only been reloaded uh twice at brass um but I had a case come apart and we were really, you know, going down the rabbit hole of of sort of reverse engineering how this happened. At and the then head? Once, uh, yeah, at the yeah, head. Except yeah. this case had, had separation. Yeah, yeah. Had to, so, uh, you know, and then so we bore scoped it and we seen this carbon build up. And, you know, one of the theories was, you know, we had so much back pressure, this thing, you know, or that created some sort of problem with the head spacing and and that's why the mm -hmm. the round um separated there and you know i'm a pretty diligent reloader um i've had good success with it and uh but uh yeah so i'm not sure what went on there but the, yeah. but that was one of the factors that you know and a more experienced shooter than me said hey you know sometimes with these prcs we're getting this happening where we're getting carbon built up right in the chamber there. And, uh, and it definitely, and I definitely did have a, you know, a very noticeable ridge line of carbon built up. Yeah. You'll, you'll see that in like the 20 nozzlers, especially too. You'll see a, uh, like a, a real carbon dark ring that, that's right at the lines. Um, yeah. It's just how, it's how the, sh the shoulders pushing and, and it too, it depends on how much uh, free neck, space there is so if your necks can like if they chamber in where they have more neck space like neck length you'll yeah. see sometimes an accumulation of that because you're not you're not close to that point so then that carbon's able to drive into that little corner again and then it'll build up and then that'll push your datum like where your 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 case is like crunched into there and then when it shoots it has nowhere to go so then it over pressures and then the back end you'll see that yeah. in belt belted magnums as well where like if there's any type of uh, tension in the front end of the case, it'll it'll blow the brass out, and then if it gets stuck, um, all that pressure has to go somewhere. So then it, it yeah. kind of reverberates back to the back of the case, and then creates this like little donut ring in the back. And the if, bright the bright donut, yeah, yeah. And if you cut it down in half, you'll see like even with like or a paper clip, you can come in there. I come in with a paper clip sometimes, and I'll feel in there, and you can and, hook that edge. Yeah yeah, 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 for sure. My father-in-law is a gunsmith and he he taught me i use a dental pick actually yeah which is i was getting nice. so paranoid about one i just like i had this gun that the datum line was way out in the shoulder so push it out like five thousandths and it was just blowing the brass out and i would cut it in half i i cut it in half put in a vice cut in half and i'm like oh yeah there's definitely a donut ring but anyway <laughs> back to the cleaning basically you just got to listen to the gun um, you know, for, if you're shooting continuously 200 rounds, I'm using wipeout. I haven't used uh, an abrasive brush in, in my guns for years now. Um, it's like a foaming agent. I, I put that shit in there and then I check the, uh, check the crown. If I, if you just look in the crown, you look with a flashlight. If you see copper streaks, that means you haven't gotten all the copper out. Because typically the highest accumulation of copper deposition is on the crown and in the lands. You can't really see in the lands unless you get a borescope. So I use the the crown as my indicator for how much copper deposition. You just do passes. And then anything you go out, if you're running on like a jig, I, un I know it's a pain in the ass, but that's why I don't clean as much is I unscrew it before I pull the rod in. I'm just super paranoid about damaging the crown. Um, Doing something right. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I do it. I just, I didn't look at it as, yeah, I didn't even think about damaging the crown. I looked at it as if I pull that back through anything that that brush is pulling backwards is pulling it into my action is the way yeah. I was just looking at it mechanically. I didn't know if I was doing it right or not, but I was like, well, if I push it out, it's out of the gun. Yeah. Out. Everything must in. go out. So like any of the gun manufacturers like Lilia and all those is like any, anything when they talk about barrel issues, it's usually because someone is either using a really high abrasive or they're just, they're pulling things in. Everything should go out. If it goes out, it's good. It's when you're pulling things back in, like brushes and jags where they're they're constantly, because if you don't have a, a fully supported uh, jag and rod, 
assembly and then you're just running it in, what are you going to do? You're going to have higher contact always on the bottom of that barrel. So you're always going to be like dragging your jig across your crown on the bottom constantly. Drag, drag, drag. I'm not saying it's going to be super damaging, but if you have that, and that's why I use muzzle brakes on all my guns so that if something happens traumatic, like I had a gun where um, I was doing some mountain hunting and my sling broke. <laughs> And my gun went flying down a mountain and it still stayed zeroed. And there was like mud packed in the barrel. It was bad. And you know, the tip of my bore, like it didn't get damaged because I had a muzzle break. The scope tracked. It was a night four scope. It, I shot a group and it was perfectly back to where it needed to be after I got the mud out. But it's just going to show like if you don't protect that and you're constantly running and into the ground in, in your in your truck you're not conscious of that, of that crown. If you go and nick it or hit it hard when you're, you're cleaning, you're, you're going to have issues. You're going to have something you can't control. And all you'll see is you go and shoot and you're like, Oh, no, it's grouping to the right now. What the hell? And then you move it in and then you put it back in your safe and you go back out again. And then boom, you shoot again. You're like, what the hell is shooting high now? Like what's going on? It's just now that you have that inconsistency, now that, that, that bullet isn't, isn't fully supported. 360 degrees around consistently and so it's not being released consistently and then you'll see your impact start jumping around everywhere there you go now we have a better idea of what the cleaning is listen to your gun shoot groups track them and then uh, clean appropriately and then before you go into season always say put a couple rounds down range always confirm your zero and that's and that's something when you're training you should be tracking your your point of impact so like on your dot shoot a dot point of impact pay attention to that depending on um you know what what how many round count you have and then when you go out and hunt it should be uh fouled uh slightly fouled that way you have consistency and you're in your operating zone of rounds i had an epiphany there <clears throat> I don't know how long, I don't know you guys listeners they haven't heard my voice in probably 20 minutes but I just had an epiphany that the conversation <laughs> is a lot better when I stay out of it listening to you and Ashley talk yeah that was way better than me Dumb well no me. it's it's good to initiate the conversation Kevin you're, you're doing a good job because you know um Ashley and I, stay out of it. For, Ashley and I, I was gonna I was gonna say the opposite. I noticed it got better, but uh, yeah. yeah, me too. Because it, that's it why, drives I, conversation. That's why I don't know if you noticed, but I pushed my mic. I seen it and you crossed I, your I arms my, and yeah, you're like, oh, I, don't I better stay out of this fucking conversation here. and let the guys that know what they're talking about it. No, talk it's it's you good. It drives conversation. It. <laughs> no, it's good. Drives conversation. Uh, it uh, asks those questions that maybe we're taking for granted, right? Um, you know, if you're just getting into this, it's it's a huge thing. Just control it. You can start writing stuff down. Take a shooting log with you and track things. Track things, and then that goes for your process too. Like like what Pete was talking about with fundamentals of marksmanship. I'll tell you a good story. Um, one of my uh, work colleagues, he he had a new Tika. Okay, we're doing some reloads uh, for him. And just me sitting down with him for 30 minutes, he went from being a one and a half inch shot to a half inch shot. Oh, In like impressive. 30 minutes that's of just nailing down the fundamentals of marksmanship. So you're dressing the rifle, you're square behind the rifle, your grip, how you're putting your hand so you're not torquing the gun, how your cheek pressure, holding your gun. That's one thing that like, like exactly what you're talking about, like with super lightweight guns, guys will grip them like death grip them, eh? Because they feel like that's going to help them because, they, oh, it's light. It's moving around more. But that actually can exacerbate the problem because you're actually, you'll start shuddering because you're holding it so tight. And that's usually kind of because, too, the gun that's light, it's going to recoil really hard. So guys want to hold it super tight. So then you'd hold the gun by the exact weight of the gun. So if I have like a 10 pound gun, that means that I can hold it up to 10 pounds of tension on my shoulder and loading on the bipod. And it's going to be super steady and consistent. If it's like a six or seven pound gun, I don't want to hold it tighter on my shoulder than what I think six or seven pounds is. Because you'll hit a certain point where 
the gun just is going to aim as good as it's going to aim at six points, uh, six pounds of tension. If I increase that tension, I'm going to increase my shuddering. So I'm going to start, you're going to start seeing your heart rate. You're going to see any little movement in your body position. You're going to see that crosshair start bouncing hard. If you ease off, you just get a little more consistent behind the gun. Cheek pressure is c consistent. I pull back my gun. I drag in the bipod. So I've loaded the gun already. So then that's going to co cause it to be tight from the bipod to my shoulder. So I don't have anything moving around. And then how I'm addressing the gun, the trigger. I'm going in the meaty part of my my finger. I'm not going to the crank. I'm not going to the tip. I'm going to going to kind of a, a lever point where I can hold steady. And this is where the misconception comes. Surprising, like when people talk, oh, the gun should surprise you. If you shoot extreme long range, I can tell you, you don't know. Oh, maybe they're just saying surprise as something different. Because when my spotter says we're good to go, I have to shoot in that wind window. And he calls me my wind. He's watching the wind. He'll say, Is spotter ready? means that my my natural exhale inhale at my first available natural respiratory pause at the bottom i have to shoot i have to lay a shot down range so then you know follow and then when you make that shot you're an actual exhale you shoot reload shoot reload shoot that way you get into that kind of that rhythm and you there's because if you hold your breath you're going to see tunneling and all of a sudden you're going to, your heart rate's going to go up and then you're going to see tunneling. So just getting into that, the ebbs and flow of your natural respiratory pause and you feel your finger, you, you, you should do dry firing before you shoot at the range. I really encourage, like, obviously if you're shooting a rim fire, don't do that, but center fires, you can, and just get through those motions of, okay, it's back to the fundamentals. WTF wind trajectory, fundamentals of marksmanship, the wind I'm paying attention to wind. I adjust my trajectory. I, I always thought WTF stand for something else. Yeah. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> but it's right. It's we know the wind. We're always, well, we're out there hunting or shooting. We're always looking at the wind. We know we have a wind meter. We're looking at those natural things around us, like trees moving. Okay. When does that happen? Direction, you know, terrain features, then trajectory. So that's, I range. I do my tra trajectory adjustment and then fundamentals of marksmanship behind the rifle, level my cant, focus on parallax bob my head to see if it flexes the line on the on the reticle if it's flexing i gotta tweak my my parallax and then i address the gun steady pressure pull back the gun lo load in the bipod address the hand position and then finger on the tr uh, trigger address the trigger control my breathing focus on aiming and then follow through on the shot and so what you should be able to do with your dry fire is you should be able to come to this the right at the point where it's going to break the shot and you should be able to hold it there with nothing happening without you commanding it. And then you just follow through the little extra. So if you have a real light trigger, that's where like people ask for real, really, really light triggers, like 12 ounce triggers. Hmm. I personally don't like that. That's where, that's where like, it'd be the difference between like, you know, Pete, what Pete's encounter with all the target shooting he's doing, like guys that take the target to the extreme, that doesn't help you in a hunting scenario sometimes. That that gets into specialized. Are you referring to like archery or bow? I mean, sorry, archery or rifle. Ar so rifle is the same. So you want to make sure that you don't get so far into like target stuff. Like, you know, it's the same thing with the bow I was saying. Like, it's so like yeah. huge stabilizers and like, so with rifle be like massive bipods, liquid head bipods, like, like bench rest type stuff. You want to make sure that it's all centered around what you're going to be doing in the areas you're hunting. So you're not like building up a bunch of shit that's going on. That's too much to manage because when, if you don't have your gear management under control and you, you simp, so you. Because initially you'll think, oh, I got my wind meter. I have all these tripods. I have all these things going on. You need to condense and simplify. Yeah, because so you're not going to be taking that out hunting with you. Or it's going to take too long yeah. to get a shot on a moving animal. So that's where you have to make sure that you're always thinking, if you're going to use this for hunting, that you're always thinking, okay, so I made that shot at 600 yards. How long did it take for me to set up? Right. Did it take like a minute? Well, that's too long. Oh, yeah. So you have to well, think about expediting those shots. Yeah. So that's where when you train, so do those train but the, everything I, the same. 
Yeah. Do you guys have like long range guns that you won't use for hunting? I don't. They just, they just fuck around with. I I that dark rifle I've shot uh, two elk and uh, like three deer with it, and it's twelve eleven pounds. So I I don't have any rifles that I don't hunt with simply because I've never really dove down the rabbit hole of 15 pound target guns and, and, and gone that way. I've tried to incorporate as much of the technology into a lighter weight hunting rig. So yeah. but that's and then, the number one intention is just hunting. Yeah. Hunting, hunting for More, sure. And then yeah. I overtrain, shoot further so I can hunt at, at reasonable ranges effectively basically and, and know your limits right like because yeah. then you know what your limits are then you yeah. know what's ethical what's what's uh what's reckless right yeah. and what's and that's the thing like exactly what ashley's talking about is yeah you push the distance you push the range but then deep down you know if taking that 700 yard shot in this type of gusty wind conditions where there's some weird topography where you have an, an updraft or thermals as well, you'll, you'll, you'll know, okay, like, yeah, that's a reckless shot. I should get closer. I should do something different. Or if you, you've rehearsed and you, you do can't build up a, uh, a shooting position. That's another thing. Then you know, damn well, how steady you mm -hmm. have to be. And you're, you're going to avoid those potential wounding shots or misjudging wind because you know, okay, I can't nail down the wind. It's like we were talking about. I can't nail down the wind. I'm not making that shot. I'm going to yeah. have to wait or, or move up or do something different. Yeah. yeah shot position is a huge consideration for sure. Sorry. Sorry, Kev. Um, and, and you know, I always thought in the back of my mind, I just, I don't want to train with something that's better than what I'm hunting with, i.e. I don't want the extra advantage in my training and then take out a weapon that doesn't have the same level of accuracy and treat it like it does. So oh, yeah. well, that that, that's why it's just, I use the tools that I'm going to use and then I, I never have to question myself because, uh, and, and the shooting position thing just, goes without saying then like we're shooting off these benches all the time shooting yeah. out you know shooting long distance shooting mm -hmm. out a thousand yards shooting 800 having great success but that, that it is rare to find uh a, a setup like that i love shooting prone uh, i train shooting prone as well um i think it's essential but it's it's hard to find those setups in the real world mm -hmm. with an animal at that you know that your your limit of your range and and just have the perfect setup there so you're usually having to get closer because you're going to be shooting off your backpack frame your yep. you know whatever yeah, yeah just like with my with my son and his elk you know he's a good shooter he shot out to 1200 uh 1300 yards before but it was a, it was a, a 300 and 380 350 yard shots um on a bull elk steep angle to a bench i had to put my pack down max a bipod that's like you can shoot almost partially squat sitting max that out put it on the pack take his pack put it on the butt make shots and then the last shot on on the bowl to put him down i had to boost him up partially into a tree like yeah. it's not perfect out there so well you and do the thing too to is line of, stuff line of sight too when you're hunting is yeah. like Especially when you're shooting a little further distance and compared to archery. When you're archery, you're, everything's in close and you're just worried about twigs not interfering with your arrow path. But when you're shooting like a couple hundred yards, you got to worry about line of sight between, you know, tops of trees and stuff like that as well. So, yeah, it's actually funny you said that because uh, while I was crawling around and I was getting my kid ready, I actually had to do a max ordinance check to make sure that we clear this branch. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I, I did it quickly with my reticle where I, I zeroed it out, made sure I'm super steady, then ran my elevation turret to see if I'm doing a run line to make sure that I'm not going to contact that, or, you know, that he's not going to contact that, that on the, on the shot trajectory. Cause mm -hmm. it was, you know, my max ordinance at the high point of my trajectory to make sure that he can shoot through a window and, and actually clear all the sticks. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Well, fascinating stuff boys as always um we've kind of been chatting here for two hours already oh yeah we didn't even get into scopes 
projectile choice. I have a list of stuff here that stuff you were talking about, like parallax and and stuff like that. But we're gonna have to wait for another day. We'll have to get Ashley back on. Yeah, that's it's fun. I I love this stuff. Uh, you know. So it's... uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do all that. But uh, quickly, when's uh the new show air? Uh, we're we're going live here on Wild TV at the first week of April. I I don't actually know the exact airing times, uh, but I'll uh, I'll share that with you once I know. Uh, I'm pretty nervous, but excited as well. And uh, Are you? like I like I said before we started filming or uh, started um, recording this, I've uh, I finished all my edits now. Um, one little delivery to do, but uh, now it's uh, I feel freed up a little bit. I can start working on a couple other YouTube projects that I have uh, lined up, and then and then before YouTube's you know, fucking it, an evil thing, man. Like. YouTube is like just like Instagram or all the other shit where like they can't like the algorithm wants you to feed the addiction where it's like you have to post every day or else your views and your analytics just go to shit like it's crazy it's it's your hitch into the bus man if it's if you don't uh, keep going with it it just forgets all about you so uh Yeah. yeah I I've totally experienced that over the the last year here, I've had a couple of initiatives that have sort of helped subscribership, but uh, by by sort of working so hard on this linear TV content, I've I've sort of not been able to keep up on that, and it sure shows, you know. So I'm just looking but your, forward. Your to getting... focus though is the TV show, right? That that's so. Do you have season Ultimate... one completed? Yeah, my my focus ultimately, if I'm being honest, is is to is to support you know is to put content on youtube and the linear channel or or on wild tv it's just it's just a big challenge like like we're talking about i'm i'm swamped and i sort of had to pick a lane and because it was a bit of a new world with some technical delivery requirements for my for the the content that i gave wild tv i um i just had to you know clamp down on that and make sure I delivered. Uh, and then, but I think this year's workflow is going to keep both streams going uh, a lot more actively. Cause I, can I just put, don't. Sorry to, can you put your YouTube, like put stuff on YouTube before you put it on TV? I can. Uh, it's, it's basically a gentleman's agreement or, or a uh. handshake agreement because I, I think they don't want to hamstring your growth curve on social because ultimately you know it's they don't want to be liable for you know slowing you up so to speak just well it's only going to benefit them if you're if your like youtube channel is bigger more people are gonna yeah yeah if they're scrolling through sportsman channel or wild tv and they see like if you have a big following on youtube and they're and they're scrolling through you the hunting channels and they see they're probably going to stop whereas if you didn't they would just keep going yeah it's and i'm at the beginning stages where i sort of both platforms are going to help boost the other so so i just want to respect the process because ultimately as as much as they and and i want to you know i i've showed teasers of a few of the hunts for sure but i ultimately want to show the 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 few hunts that i've that I filmed for last year, um, you know, in their whole form on wild TV first as a, as a, basically a thank you, so to speak. And ultimately, you know, they'll decide if they want to play with me again, you know, if, if I start, you know, burning all the, all the footage out, uh, socially beforehand and I don't get, um, viewership on wild, then I guess, you know, they decide to go a different way. So, just trying to manage it and learn it. I I don't really know it, um, but yeah, I'm just trying to uh, apply what I know. Are you doing a season two? Uh, I, I for think Wild the op- TV, the opportunities there. I believe. Um, Did I just totally I, put you on the spot? <laughs> no, not at all. I, I <laughs> well, have... I wasn't. I wasn't going to asshole, but I didn't want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> but that that's I don't mind being put on the spot. I mean, the truth is what the truth is. Uh I haven't signed for it yet. The intent's there. I'm gonna I'm gonna take a hard look at, at how this goes, to be honest. And it's a lot so of work. Wild, 
so will wild tv uh yeah, yeah i'm kind of addicted to it though like i really just want to push to learn how to tell stories that are engaging and mm -hmm. uh and I'm not there yet, but I, I, there's a story of the resident hunter that I want to tell. And uh, I'm just at the beginning, so I just want to. Well, that's what's. Pushing. Yeah. Sorry, buddy. Um, that's what's cool. I wanted to get this in before we stop talking about it, about your show is that, you know, like one thing about hunting shows is it's like not all of them, but most of them, it's like they're doing a guided hunt and it's all like they're all exactly the same. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just like. Where you're yeah. telling, like, and you with yours, you specifically said you're not going to do. It's going to be all like resident hunters. You following the story of different resident resident hunters throughout their journey, and just showcasing all the different you know unique aspects of the resident hunter. Yeah, it's it's, cool. it's and it's, the, unfortunately the hard part with that is is success rate goes down because if you're doing a guided hunt, your success rate goes up compared to if it's just the DIY and you're showcasing more of the DIY stuff. Yeah, I, I I am, and it's important for me to tell the resident hunter stories that are beyond myself for sure, because there's multiple perspectives. But, but I also I really I have this crazy fantasy where I think that the story and the struggle of the resident hunter is just as valuable as having guaranteed guided hunts. And I think that the audience today is is more ready for that story than they may have ever been. So I'm going to more relatable. Yeah. More it, it's like more relatable. A, every time I watch a, a canned hunting show, uh, so to speak, it, it doesn't, it doesn't depict the way I hunt and the way I was brought up hunting. It has elements. Sure. There's a harvest there. Uh, you know, there's, there are quite a few, uh, people out on the social platforms and some that are on TV that show a more authentic style of a hunt. And that's what I'm going for. Unfortunately, I wish the world would let me just keep pumping out hiking videos and, and calling them hunting <laughs> films. But, you know, Nick, I, that's, I, that's, uh, that's, I got a, my hunt, my old hunting buddy and I, we call that uh, extreme nature walking. Yeah. Uh, we call it hiking with guns. <laughs> That's uh, yeah. that's that's a uh, my buddy Jesse says. Well, you need to change your channel name to Hiking yeah. with Guns. Uh, yeah, and <laughs> there there's a good what it's taught me though. It's it's taught me a, a lot about you know what to film besides hunting. Uh, and then you know we're working really hard. I've got a lot of hunting planned this year and um, a lot of extended trips to to try and get that success even even from the resident perspective because it takes time time and pressure kind of thing so i know what to do it's just trying to do it in two and three day chunks is um is where i've been running into some some trouble there so yeah we've got some extended uh hunts this year which i'm your hoping... mule deer your mule deer epi like the pursuit of your mule deer like that is probably like that could have been a season like all the way up from like the struggles of like you were going so hard and then it just like crashed and burned at the end. Whereas like yeah. normally it's like everyone's waiting to see this epic success. And it was yeah. like, it was like opposite. Oh, like, yeah. No, no. Longer. Crash that's your what, truck, I... get stuck in a hotel for two days, like bus home. Yeah. It's, um, uh, it's. <laughs> You know, Honestly. I think I think there's a good story there. If I oh, could, fucking for know, sure there is. Like, I, and the, but I, that's the reality of that's the reality of like hunting's hard, man. And like yeah. hunting's not all just like you don't just go out and go hunting for a day or two and go shoot something. Like that's not the reality. Maybe yeah, on a guided no. hunt you do, but the reality is it's not. It's not like that. It's like it's going out, suffering, grinding, coming home, going back yeah. out, yep. getting up early nothing coming back it's just persistence and like whoever pers like if you go hunt it's playing the odds i mean obviously the the more you hunt the better you 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 learn a lot of things of what to do and what not to do and like that makes you a better hunter but in reality you still have to go grind it out put your time in even when you you've gone through all this stuff it's still like i still hunt a lot of days of the year to kill all the animals yeah sure i punch a lot of tags but I mean, I also put a shit ton, like my average isn't very good. If you've counted the number of days I put in for the amount of tags I push, it's not that great. Do you know what I mean? So like, but that's the reality of hunting. It's not, 
it's not easy it's not like it's persistence it's like constant work it's grind like derek said it's the grind but that's what's awesome about it i i do i love the grind too i'm i'm savage like i got eight terabytes of grind without a kill at the end like that that's what this <laughs> equates to and, no, and that's a lot like that's a lot of, that's hours and hours i you know i i yeah. think i have probably 15 hours of actual rolling footage from uh the mule deer season wow. without a kill at the end so you know that 15 hours turns into a three minute segment at the beginning of hopefully next year's successful mule deer hunt so you know the work that it takes to put it into a show that's going to be relatable and digestible is it's it's big but i'm just I'm as addicted to it as I am to hunting and I'm pretty darn addicted. So I'd, I'd be well, curious actually to ask the general public, well, maybe not even the general public, the people who enjoy watching hunting shows, if they, if all they're looking for is that kill shot at the end, because I stopped watching a lot of hunting shows um, and no particular people, you know, specifically, but it got boring after a while. You go mm -hmm. out, they go, they got to kill at the end. Be like, fuck off. That's yeah, not the how same stuff. That's well, then that's the thing I was shit. talking about on TV. It's always the same. Like, not all of yeah. them. I'm not like saying it. they're all the same, but like a lot of them were structured, and that was kind of like the hip thing to do was to just get a guided hunt, show a little tiny bit of this, and yeah. then show like two thir a third of it is like the kill shot, and like that's it. And let's like, okay, well, how many times can you fucking watch that? It's the same over and over and over and over. But I want to see the struggles. I want to see you not be able to get that shot. I want to see your miss because that's freaking reality. And I'm, I'm more apt to watch that in the whole process, you know, as long as it's entertaining, obviously it's, you, you have yeah. to somehow keep me attracted to, you know, what's happening next, what's happening next. I don't, the kill's great at the end if it happens, but I want to watch, you know, the, you, you had some excitement that's for sure <laughs> uh, but you know what i mean that's that's the part you know yeah because any any experienced hunter knows that in between is where the killing's done that's oh, where yeah. the success yeah. is it's not it's not necessarily right at the end or like if it just happened quick i always think i'm like well it's not luck but there is an element of that to me, I'm always looking for learning something from someone else, whether that's motivation, discipline, techniques, keeping your head in the game, because you don't know if that opportunity is going to come in the first 15 minutes or it could be in the last 15 minutes when you're the most fatigued, where you're you're going in the deepest you were because you didn't have success on the on the the quick, easy hunts. And you're going farther in there than before. And you have more more pressure on you because you're running out of time that's that's where i'm always interested in seeing what people are doing that's that is hunting that's that's the entertainment for me it's not necessarily the kill but it's too it's relatable you think man i've been in that i've had that happen how many times where you know you're just you're not, you stop seeing deer and then and then they're you're grinding you're out there you have that belief and uh and that's where you learn things from other people and and uh learn how they address that that hardship that grind that suffering yeah for sure man well buddy you're successful in everything else i'm sure this is gonna be a success too so hey it, it'll be fun regardless so yeah for sure anyway i think we'll wrap it up guys um okay eric good information as always uh so for the listeners this is going to come out before the sportsman show so make sure you get down um derek is doing i don't know probably cover a lot of the same stuff it's going to be i think it's about an hour an hour and a half you're going to be doing the presentation derek yeah i think uh i think we'll start off with uh differentiating uh two different tiers of of weapons platforms whether that's you know your full customs well you know we really don't need to discuss if you're doing a turnkey gunworks type setup um because that's all going to be set up out of the box but more like your semi customs um, optimizing the, the existing gear that you do have, how you kind of consolidate, put it all together. And then we might dig into some reloading, equipment choices, stuff of that nature, fundamentals of marksmanship, um, how we're uh, gear managing and, and validating trajectories, truing up stuff. You know, there's going to be a lot of things. So uh, if you do have any questions too, like if you end up going to the show, just think of a couple of questions that if there's something that maybe I can help you out with or make sense of uh that could help you uh yeah, definitely that's, ask that's that. a good and, idea uh, and 
Uh, yeah, I'll start putting some stuff out on Instagram too. So we'll yeah, get, some, get those get, questions, get the ball rolling, and uh, Stockless. Hopefully, you're you you talked about coming up. Hopefully, you're coming up for that, so people will get to meet you and and talk to you. And I think your show will be airing roughly around that time, so it'd be kind of cool to get people's attention and uh, kind of push that as well. And yeah, for sure. Uh, I'm a hundred percent coming. I'm at the BC outdoor show this coming weekend, and then I'll be coming up to the interior sportsman show to hang with you guys and to, uh, yeah, just to, maybe uh, we'll all get a workout in together. That sounds fun. Yeah. Fucking running. Oh, don't running. Think about, don't uh, even think about it. Toy. Don't even I, think no. about it. I'll do, I'll I knew, do a, a I knew rock. I was going to get a, a reaction to the pizza uh, as I said. He's like, fuck off. Anyway, boys, it was a lot of fun chatting with you guys. Yeah. Cheers.